And I'm going to share my desktop. All right, so today's workshop is going to be kind of a overview of a lot of different modeling techniques within Rhino, um, techniques that range from basics to more advanced things that I've developed over the course of my career. So I'm kind of, I'm going to try to pack as much as I can within this work session and hopefully at the end of it, you will have learned enough and you will have enough confidence in how easy it is to actually model stuff in 3D that you will get excited and eager to begin diving into your Greenway projects. Um, the, whole, the whole goal of this assignment is to treat modeling as kind of this really fun uh, creative tool, similar to how, say, for instance, you, you kind of see all the architecture students, you know, in studio, they're building site models with chipboard and basswood and all the fun things and they're just experimenting and having fun and, and coming up with ideas. That's essentially what we do um, with this tool as well, is it's a fun way to design and come up with ideas and, and play around with it. And that's really what it, it should feel like. If it doesn't feel like you're having fun and, and just designing, then that's just, that's just a sign that the tool is kind of like a barrier as opposed to um, an actual creative outlet for your ideas. And so hopefully, so, you know, just to be, you know, clear, like the, the whole point is to master the tool so that the tool becomes um, part of your skill set, not, uh, like I said, a barrier. So I know, um, based on previous conversations from the last workshop, there was a lot of um, uh, comments on how most students were fairly beginner level at modeling. And so I'm treating this workshop as if you all started from zero. So even if you had some modeling um, in the past, um, bear with me as I go through some of the basics at the very top, um, but then we'll slowly advance our way to uh, ways that you can take this to next next level and then begin to make, realize the design realistically. Um, the assignment, I'll, I'll lay out the assignment. Um, actually, I can lay out the assignment now. Let me just do that just so you can get, get an understanding of what you're going to do after the workshop. So the assignment already has been posted to box assignment five. So you can look at it in your um, own time. And this is essentially what we're gonna go for is we're gonna to try to go for a 3D site section, a typical site section of your project. Um, so everything you see here is primarily modeled in 3D. There are a little bit of Photoshop elements, um, like say for instance, some specific buildings and, and that kind of thing, even like little touches like that in the ground itself. But by and large, I would, I would like your models to be, let's say this 75% um, to 80% modeled in 3D with a few touch-ups at the end. Um, let's say for instance, you want to have more realistic looking planting or you want to have uh, like, like uh, actual architectural buildings in your model. Those can be added in Photoshop because those are sometimes a little bit harder to model in 3D. But Everything else, um, try your best to model in 3D. So the assignment will basically be a, a typical site section of your Grimmery project. Um, this typical section is, you know, look at your project site and identify, you know, the, the, the Greenway typology that is repeatable, that is most common across the entire length of your trail. And what you want to present is like for the majority of of the river region trail along my segment, this is probably kind of what it will look like. And so that's what the typical section kind of is. And what you were, we're trying to illustrate this best practices, like in our typical um, area of my site, these are the best practices that I, I'm recommending for you uh, river region trails to do within this area from a standpoint of greenway width, greenway materiality, greenway planting and branding elements as well. So one thing I am going to talk about in this workshop is this line right here, branding elements, uh, should be a huge part of your greenway itself. And the reason we want to do that is because, again, uh, all everything that we are basically producing as part of the studio is work that we are offering to uh, Montgomery River Region Trails as part of their 
um, toolkit that they can use to go out, raise interest, raise funds, that kind of thing. And so making sure that we respect that, that aspect that's already been started in terms of like their logo, their fonts, their colors, blah, blah, blah. Um, that would just make, make the work cohesive and, and stronger overall. Uh, the last line here, what I wrote, this is design, this is not your design. Design what you believe the agreement should look like and follow through with your recommendation. Um, that's a that's a that's an important point of emphasis that uh, you, I think I mentioned this in studio one time. Um, you are now the designer. You are now the landscape architect. You're no longer a student. You now need to go to pretend like you are working for this client and saying, based on my analysis of your site, based on my knowledge of my studies, based on everything that I've learned up to this point, I think this is the best way for you to approach agreement within your site. You're providing a recommendation. This is what we do as designers. So you're not looking for, um, uh, let's put this, you're not looking for uh, approval or acceptance. You're not looking for, did I do it right? You're not asking that question. You're asking basically, um, this is what I think you need essentially as, as part of that. So I just want to change that mindset. You don't, don't approach this as a, as a, as a thing. It's like, did I do it correctly? Or did I do it, do it, do it wrong? Approach this from a standpoint of, I think this is what you need at this point. So just that's the, the approach of thinking like a designer. Um, the format for this small little assignment here, it will be within uh, next week or so. So today is October 29th. Let me pull this calendar here, October 29th. Uh, next week will be the entire week you can work on this assignment and then we'll have a pin up and discussion on the Monday after, so November 8th. So I don't think this assignment will take particularly long to, to do as long as you you know put a few hours each day in your model and putting together. But essentially what we're going to create are two types of images. One is a 3D site section, similar to what you see right here. And then the last one, we have a rendered view because once you build the thing in 3D, you can, you can just jump into the model, pick a perspective and actually create an actual rendering. And what we want to do is we want to start the process of creating renderings and images of this for the project. So typically, you know, when we do studio projects, we save the rendering for the end. We're, right now we're doing the rendering now because you're going to do more of these as we go along this and you got to get good at this. You have to learn how to put together these images um, now so that's not a deliverable that's rushed in the end it's, and looks bad and looks photoshoppy. You got to actually spend time on this. Um, renderings are, are deliverables that I think, I mean, you, you guys tell me, I think are sometimes put to the, put like thrown to the very end of a project and sometimes aren't given, given as much attention as I think they deserve, but they are the most important deliverable of the, of the project, especially for these public clients like, um, River Region Trails, they need renderings. Um, when I was working for Great Rivers Greenway, the rendering was the one that the CEO wanted the most. Like they said, like everything that you're doing in terms of like plans, maps, diagrams, graphics are all fine, but I just really need one really good rendering because they're, they're going to use that rendering and they're going to go out to the public and they're going to present this idea to people. So renderings are, are, are way more important than you think. And so that's why it's not a good idea, in my opinion, for projects like this to save it to the very end. Um, we need to look at it. We need to revise it. We need to um, uh, workshop the rendering as we go. So this uh, deliverable will be two things. One is the section and one is the perspective. So both of these will be generated out of the three model that we're going to build. So you can read this. Um, and then one thing I mentioned at the bottom of the perspective is, you know, you know, take inspiration from the stuff that we you did at field work with the photos, you know, think about lighting, composition, mood, um, scale figures, like that's why we did the whole assignment is that, you know, what we're trying to do is trying to go for something that, like I'm calling here, cinematic and photographic. We're not looking, we're not going for Photoshop, collage you know, stuff that you might have done in the past. Or I want you to instead go for realism this time. It's a whole different, whole different thing. Um, and then here is where you, I'm giving you guys my suggestions on how each of you might approach your typical section. And so I, 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 I kind of like thought about each student's project. And what I'm trying to create here is a wide um, palette of different sections that when we look at the entire studio as a whole, everyone has something different that they're saying with their section. So what I don't want is everyone to do a, like a street section. What I don't want everyone to do is like a, like a, a section through nature. I want everyone to try to do something a little bit different. And so based on what I understand of your projects, I, I kind of 
came up with this list here, what each student should look at. So this is a recommendation. This is my suggestion for you all. You can change if you wanted to, but I think it's better if we all have something that's like fun and different. So, you know, obviously like Taylor at the top, he's the, he's one student who's working on the actual river walk. So he's gonna have the river walk section, right? Um, if you, you know, Lily's working in the cemetery. So she'll have a, a, a section of the greenway that looks at how that looks within the cemetery and on and on and on. And so hopefully, you know, most of you will agree with my recommendation for your section. If you wanna change it, just we'll have that discussion in studio next week. Okay, any questions about the assignment? Workshop, all right, so workshop, um, we're gonna learn how to model in Rhino. Uh, Rhino is, let me zoom into this description here. When I was in school, um, Rhino was the tool that I learned and I was in school back in 2000, from 2007 to 2011, that was when I was an undergrad and then um, when I was in graduate school, it was 2011 to 2013. So, you know, almost 10 something years ago, um, well, maybe like eight, but, um, Rhino was taught when I was in school. It's still being taught today. Um, what's funny is now that like, yeah, I'm like kind of eight years out of school um, in practice. I'm beginning to see um, students of my generation, like people I went to school with. Now they're now like senior associates. Some of them are principals at firms now. So like the Rhino generation is becoming the leaders of the firm now. So when I, the whole point is this, is that learning Rhino is good because because uh, the people because the tools that I was learning in school are the tools that um, the leaders at firms now are using. So it's it's just like it kind of has become the the language, the modeling language um, of our industry. So good, it's a good tool. And I'm looking at these pictures and I see Craig has a Craig has a cat. So I I notice cats whenever they appear. All right. Mimi won't show up today because I've closed all my doors because Mimi is a, is a distraction. Um, so yes, Rhino is a good tool to learn um, and it'll be very useful for your um, career as it progresses. Um, hopefully you'll have Rhino installed on your computers now. Uh, if you need uh, you know, resources, I recommend using the virtual workstations that Auburn provides. And it's pretty, it's pretty, pretty legit. If you've tried the, the virtual workstations, they, they're actually pretty legit. And uh, um, let's say, for instance, your graphics card ain't, ain't doing its job and crashing, you know, try using that. And I think you'll be happy that, you know, you have that resource available to you guys. Um, workshop data has been uploaded to the box. So if you'd like to follow along, go download the information within workshop three. This is what it looks like right now. Um, a lot of files of various types. Um, there's two really big file types, textures and North Grand. So North Grand, this one right here, this is a demo model. This is a model I built for um, uh, GRG. This is not the most important one to download. You can download, download this one last. Uh, textures is just a, a library of textures that I've used over the course of my work. So I'm giving that to you guys for so that you can have like head start on your textures um, for the modeling stuff. Um, and then I'll, I'll, obviously I'll record this for the YouTube uh, page and I'll upload, that, upload that later. So this is how uh, you should think about modeling whenever you do things in 3D is that you need to think about modeling within these four categories of objects, um, boundaries, surfaces, transitions, and objects. Um, if, you, if you categorize everything that you're modeling within these categories, it actually makes a little bit sense because what essentially everything that we do in landscape architecture in terms of like site objects and site elements usually fits within one of these four categories pretty cleanly. So, you know, for instance, you know, we, we have surfaces and surfaces tend to be like our paved areas, our plaza areas, our areas that are generally more or less uh, perceptibly flat. And so that's why I call it right here. Um, obviously we know that, you know, not every surface that we design is actually flat because of drainage, but surfaces are perceptibly flat. And generally that means less than 2% or no greater than 2%. Um, so what we do is, uh, you know, that's one object that we model like basically as holes because generally surfaces, because of their general flatness, they tend to have a fairly uh, regular elevation across the whole uh, surface of it. So therefore, we can model those things and cover a lot of ground really quickly. And I'll show you how you, how you guys can do that real um, simply. Uh, the second part are transitions. So you got to separate surfaces from transitions. And transitions are basically, if, if these are our surfaces, right? 
there's always something in between the surfaces that transitions. So that's just, that could be, say, for instance, a sloped walk. It could be a ramp, um, stairs. It could just literally just be a slope, you know, a planted slope between surfaces. And so transitions are like the spaces between uh, surfaces. And um, that's also really important to do. And transitions, I would also include, say, for instance, walks and sloped ramps and that kind of thing. Um, third object are boundaries. So these are like basically walls, buildings, curbs. And so generally speaking, any vertical element that uh, creates a vertical separation between objects. Um, and boundaries can also include planted objects such as like, uh, like a row of trees or a row of hedges. Um, and so boundaries are kind of like, you know, that vertical separation. Um, and then the last object are just objects, side objects. And this is usually the last thing you model when you do this kind of stuff. So side objects get things like furniture, signage, um, planting, handrails, anything that's just like literally an object that sits within the model itself. And these are usually the last thing that you need to model. So uh, the way I like to, to describe this is when you're approaching the model, try to approach it from this order, which is you deal with surfaces, which kind of covers larger areas first, transitions, the areas between boundaries, which are the walls, and then objects. And so if you approach it from this, from this standpoint, it'll begin to make sense as opposed to trying to like think to yourself, I got a model, a whole landscape at once, just break it down within these elements and it'll actually make a lot more sense. Any questions about this methodology? All right, is uh, my audio, audio clear? Everything clear, everything, everything good, ready to go? Are people following along or just listening? Following um, along. There's a, like, there's like a, there's a lawnmower outside. I don't know if you can hear my lawnmower. The lawnmower outside my, no, good, good. I'm worried about, uh, worrying about the thing. Okay, so let's get going. All right, so the first things that we're gonna talk about, let me move this to the side, is getting to know Rhino. So again, like I said, we're going to approach this as if you guys know nothing. But you guys do know stuff, I assume, or do you actually really know nothing? Um, so whenever you open, so the first thing that I want everyone to open is uh, the file that's called workshop underscore three. And this is the, this is the, this is the uh, model space that we're going to play around within for the first um, 30 minutes to 45 minutes of this tutorial. And again, this is meant to um, introduce you all to basically the whole process of working within uh, Rhino. So whenever you open a model, um, you always wanna make sure that you have the layout of your workspace kind of organized in such a way where it makes sense for you. So you, you can see, for instance, you know, the command window here, you can you know, move it around. Let's say you like the command window um, at the top. You want to move it to the top, like here. You can just make sure that you have everything laid out in a way that makes sense for you. Um, usually on the side here, you have um, a bunch of tabs and maybe you don't need all these tabs. So what you could do is you could um, click on this button right here and turn things off that you don't need. So say for instance, this rendering tab you don't need, just turn it off, right? That goes away. Just make, it, just make it so that everything is cleaned up. Usually the only tabs that are most important are this one called properties and this one called layers right here. Those are the ones that are two most important ones. And also name views is also pretty important as well because those are your saved, uh, saved camera angles. But layers and properties are really important. So you might have other ones here, just turn them off if, um, if um, uh, you don't need them. Um, the first thing you should always do whenever you open a Rhino model, and this is this is like a step that everyone forgets, is type in units. So in your command line, just type in units. You can see I type in units, hit enter. And what's gonna open up is the properties of this model, and you're gonna see the model units right here. If you start a model from scratch, um, sometimes the units might be in millimeters, sometimes it might be in meters, you just want to make sure that you always are working in feet. This is a step that a lot of people forget is to just make sure that you're working in the right units. So I always say, 
you know, first thing I always do whenever I start any model is just type in units and make sure that I'm working in feet. The model that I've given you guys already should be in feet. So you can just click um, OK and you're good. Um, the next thing that we're going to do is we're just going to uh, understand the controls within Rhino. So <clears throat> the left mouse button, like right here, the left mouse button allows you to drag in and select. And so dragging and selecting allows you to select objects within Rhino. Notice how dragging from the, from the left side and dragging from the right side have different effects. So if I drag from the left side, like so, this is kind of like similar to in AutoCAD where it only selects objects that are entirely within the selection window. But if, it only, if it's only partially within the selection window like this, it doesn't select it. And then the opposite, if you select dragging from the right to the left, this is now selecting everything that fits within the, that touches the selection window. So it's pretty simple to understand, right? Um, the right mouse button allows you to spin around the model. So this is your, your panning tool or rotation tool, I mean, sorry. If you hold shift on your keyboard and then, then hold the right mouse button, this allows you to um, pan the model, move around. So shift, right mouse allows you to pan around. If you don't hold shift, again, that's back to rotate. Scroll reel allows you to zoom in and out of your model. Scroll in and out, pretty, stri pretty straightforward. You can also hold the uh, control button on your keyboard. And then that allows you to, if you hold the right mouse button, it allows you to zoom in and out like so. So master these controls. If once you begin to master these controls, it should be easy to pan, move, zoom in, out, zoom, look around. What you wanna be able to do is you wanna be able to like navigate your model with ease so that um, you can quickly move to a spot and not have to think too hard. So get used to these controls. So literally, I'm just like going for the next for the next like 30 seconds, just like getting used to the controls, the pan, zoom in and out, rotation, everything like that. And so you should be able to master the controls within a couple of within a minute of just just playing around with these tools. Again, like I said, I'm starting from from step zero. I'm not. I'm assuming I'm assuming no no experience in Rhino. Um, and the most the number one step in Rhino is just like how do I actually move around Rhino. And so that's, that's what this step is about. Um, <clears throat> okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a few um, things that I like to do to set up my uh, Rhino interface in such a way where it's easy for me to um, navigate within Rhino. So one thing I will do, I'll ask everyone to do is to click on say uh, this polyline line. So on the Left side of Rhino, there's a thing called polyline. You click on that and just draw a couple of zigzags like so. Um, I'm guessing that for most of you guys, that when you draw that zigzag, you'll see a control point at each vertice when you draw that. Is that true? So I think that's a little bit of a little bit of annoying, annoying thing. And I don't like that. So what I recommend everyone doing is to go to your options. So you can go to options by clicking on this little thing called options. It looks like a little cogwheel. You can obviously just type in options in the command line and that um, brings up the options um, window again. To go into your options menu and then go to the um, mouse, which is uh, right here. Yep. And right options, there's this thing called mouse. And then in the selection thing down here, there's this control points when selecting a curve um, that you can just turn off. So right now, I, I already had it turned off. If I click OK, you see uh, when I click it, now the control points turn on. But if I go back to options and turn that off, then when you select an object, that doesn't come up. The reason, like, reason I like to do that is because sometimes, you know, you if you those, those control points turn on, you might accidentally move a control point as opposed to simply moving the whole thing by itself. Um, what I'd like to do is I like to control the time whenever the 
control points turn on whenever, whenever you're drawing objects um, or selecting objects within Rhino. So that's uh, step one. All right. Step two, go to your options and go to this thing called aliases. So in Rhino options, there's a thing called aliases. And then type, uh, hit import. And then go to the folder um, that um, the workshop three folder that uh, was unboxed. And I should have put in there a thing called Frank's Rhino, Rhino keyboard aliases. So import that into, into uh, Rhino. So if you do that, what I've done is I've created a bunch of keyboard aliases that I, um, I find to be very helpful and useful and easy to remember. And so, you know, like sometimes like what you need is you need to basically have like really simple keyboard shortcuts that gives you uh, access to your most commonly used um, commands. And so I've created a few here that um, I find very useful for my workflow. You can change it to yours later if you need to. But what you see a lot of is you see when this lister is a lot of like double letters, like CC, FF, LL, NN, OO, PP, TT, um, or letters that are really close to each other on the keyboard. And so this is where you master, master uh, the workflow is to be able to like access your tools really quickly. And so let me show you a few examples. So if you have that zigzag, zigzag line, that, line that you drew, one tool that is used commonly is the fillet tool, right? And that's FF. So what do you use? You, you type in FF and hit the space bar with your thumb. So you see like it's, it's like FF space, FF space. And so what you're doing is you're mastering, you're making so that the tool isn't something where you have to like move around your hands so much. You can just like quickly get to a tool real fast. So when I, I'll, I'll do it one more time, FF space and see so you're immediately at your fillet tool. And then you can you know adjust the radius right here. So I just click on radius, set it to five, and then you can click, click, and then to repeat the tool, just hit spacebar again, or use the, the right mouse button and that can repeat the tool. So if you click the right mouse button, that repeats the tool. Hey Frank, sorry to interrupt your flow. I think the Mac interface is slightly different. How do you import that, um, that library that you just did? The Mac interface? I don't know, because if, if you're using Rhino on Mac, I, I can't help you. Well, if I could just see it again, I might be able to make the connection, just like the menu you were looking Okay, at. so in, Go to options. Go to aliases right here. I don't know if there. I don't know if Ryan, if uh, the Mac version has import in there. All right. Let's see if I can find that. Thank you. Yeah, I can't have like Macs. I can't help you guys. I I've never used Rhino on a Mac before. Um, I would I, if you have a Mac. I would highly recommend you find a way to use Mac, uh, to Rhino on Windows, whether it's through the virtual desktop or uh, Parallels, as some of you've already done. Uh, but Okay. I mean, Thanks. Max, Max, you never should have bought a Mac. Let's just put it that way. And I can't, I can't emphasize that enough. It was a huge mistake for anyone who was recommended to buy a Mac. It really is not the tool that we use in our field. Um, for graphic design, sure. Yes, you use Max. For video editing, like if you're a YouTuber, yes, you use Max. But for architecture and, and landscape architecture, we use Windows. Um, Okay, so FF is one that's for fillet. Um, offset is one as well. So let's say you have a line here, OO, that's offset. So now you can click on a curve and you can offset it real, really quickly. Um, copy is CC. And so that allows you to quickly copy objects like so. Um, trim or split. So if you have intersecting curves like so, like here, to trim, you click on a line, hit TR. So the TR is right next to each other, hit enter. And then you can quickly trim objects like so. You can also split as well. So split if you have intersecting lines like so. TT is what I use for split. So that means what you do is you select the objects you wanna split, hit enter, then click the line that's splitting the objects. And then you have split the lines in half like so. Um, rotate is RR. So type in RR, select the object you want to rotate, hit enter, then choose a rotation access point, then choose a reference uh, point, and then the next point like so. So RR is rotate. And then the, the, 
the one that I use probably more often, there are two tools I use quite a lot. Um, one's called uh, Points On. And for me, that's PP. And that, that allows you to do is that allows you to turn on the points. You remember how I said, you know, uh, I don't like it when I select an object and the points are on. Well, I use instead the points on, which is PP. And then that allows you to like have those points just be on at all times. And so that allows you to take points, move them around. But then when you don't want, we don't want to see the points anymore, just like just hit escape and they disappear. So PP points on, and then you can select any object, hit enter, and you get the control points for that geometry and it allows you to edit it um, like so. And then it goes away when you don't need it. So it's not like, again, when you, when you select an object and the points turn on, it just turns on when you need it. Then the next one I use quite a lot is set point. So for me, that's SS. Actually, no, it's not. Actually, yes, it is. Set point, yes. And so what that allows you to do is it allows you to select any object like so, then allows you to um, immediately set an elevation to it or um, project it to a certain plane, X, Y, and Z. So the, the one I use quite a lot is this. So I uncheck X, uncheck Y, only set Z. So what happens when you do that is you click OK. That allows you to basically project that to any elevation uh, that you have reference in the model. Say, for instance, this little box here, I want this curve now to be at the same elevation as the top of the box. I can now click anywhere on the top of the box and now that curve has now moved to the top. So it looks, it seems like it's similar to move, right? But it's a lot of a faster way to move things. So let's say you wanna um, move this. The typical command to move is hit M and then you, you move it to this object here, but it moves it and sometimes a little bit hard to control the, um, like you can see I actually moved it, not just vertically, but also horizontally. Um, I like set point because it just makes it really easy. Once you, once you have the, the workflow figured out, it just allows you to easily move things vertically up and down to the right elevation. And as you know, in landscape architecture, we're always dealing with um, settings, elevations at certain, like say for instance, you have a plane and you need to set that at a certain elevation. Um, set point is a tool that I use quite a lot. Um, another another uh, way you can do this is, let's say for instance, you have a curve here and you wanna actually move it back to the, to the, to the um, let's just move a bunch of curves at random elevations. Let's say you wanna take all these curves here and you want to set them all back to zero. Let's say you wanna have a simple flat, um, drawing, you can set, select all these curves, hit SS, and then they all come back down at once. So set point is a very, very handy um, tool that allows you to very quickly bring a lot of objects to one elevation really quickly. Um, when you're, sorry. Go ahead. When you were bringing them all back just then, did you type zero to get back to zero or what did you click there that took them to the same spot? I think I missed that. So you can see right here, for instance, I got all these elements. Let's even do something like this as well. Let me show another example. This is, this is really handy if you have geometry that's really poorly drawn. Um, a lot of times when you, when you work with uh, civil engineers and, and those people, like, like they will draw contours in CAD and the CAD contours are like doing this weird thing where they're just like all over the place. It's because they don't draw the contours in 3D. They draw the contours in 2D. And then they have some contours in 3D. And so what happens is you get a lot of contour lines that look like this. Um, so you need, to, you need a quick way to clean this up. You just look at this and go, okay, like I just need a plan. So what you do is you select the objects you want to clean up. You hit SS. And then make sure that only set Z is set. And click okay. And if you click anywhere else, anywhere, anywhere in the model, it automatically, you can see, projects it to just a zero elevation. So all you do is just click anywhere in the model and then everything is now cleaned up real quick. So if you, yeah. hit, S, if you hit SS and you click, say for instance, another elevation, you can actually set it to a different elevation as well. But if you don't select an object, a reference object. If you if you're if you're all you do is you're selecting in the in like just the ether, then it just goes to zero. What other commands? I'm looking through my list here. Um, trim adjustments. 
Um, one, another one that's really handy as well. So similar to fillet is a connect. So let's say you, you're just drawing your design and you're not very good at drawing and you know you have you know curves that are doing stuff like this. I have a, there's a tool called connect. So that's NN. Let's say you said, okay, I need to connect these lines here. NN gives you connect. You can choose a couple of uh, curves and they can immediately just clean up that connection real fast. Um, this is also works, say for instance, it's almost like a trim as well. Let's say you have curves like this and you wanna say like, do another way to trim that. You can just do NN, connect those curves like that. So it's a very, it's like, it's like a similar to trim, but just a little bit, a little bit different. Um, it's, it's really the most, like that tool is really the most handy if you say you have a condition like this. Like curves that are just like offset just a little bit, like not exact. And you see, you see this a lot in, in, in site plans is, is you have curves that are kind of connected. And so just type in and, and you can just quickly connect them together. Um, where it does it essentially just projects one line out, projects the next line out, and just kind of finds the intersection point that cleans it up there. So those are <clears throat> those are just a few um, very simple, basic drawing helping tools that I use, and I set them all to a keyboard shortcut. So um, what I recommend everyone do is just get used to these keyboard shortcuts. If you have a keyboard shortcut that for a tool that you like to use a lot, you know, create an alias for that just by going into the into the options tool here, go to aliases and create your own um, alias. You can create a new one, um, set it to a letter and then uh, copy the tool here. And you can see how the, the way that the command is, is written is it has this weird way where it's like an exclamation point with an underscore and then the name of the tool. That's how you got to write it out if you want to use that. It's pretty easy to figure it out once you, if you need to go that far. Are the are the keyboard commands that you just said like typical or did are they ones you made? I made them and uh, I made them because <clears throat> if you use Revit in Revit, a lot of keyboard commands tend to be double letter commands. And so when I do whenever I'm working, because you because what you do is you'll work between multiple programs is you want to make sure you want to like, try to match as many of like common tools between them as much as possible. So they're not they're not standard, but they're they're easy for me. And, and you'll and hopefully you you all will understand what I'm going for is that you need to just access your tools really quickly. Um, let me give you an example. Like CP um, is usually copy in CAD, I believe. Like if you type in CP on your keyboard, that usually makes you copy. But CP on the keyboard are like so far from each other. Like you can see on the keyboard, like the C and P are like like a mile apart from each other, and it's it's really awkward to type in CP on your keyboard. CC is really fast. What you're, what you're going for is you're going for efficiency. You're going for, you, you, well, like I said at the very beginning, the, the tool cannot be a barrier to the design idea. And what you gotta do is gotta make the actual workflow process just faster and more fun and fluid. And if it's such a, if it's such a, a pain to, like for instance, um, uh, the PP, the points on command that I mentioned before, with that, if it was before uh, it was PP, it was PON. And PON is like three letters you got to type on your keyboard and, and to access the, this tool here. So I made it simple just by doing uh, PP on the keyboard. And then that allows you to bring that tool real quickly. Any, anyone who's like, who's worked in programs or software knows about like just general workflow is all about shortcuts. That's, that's, that's how you master a tool. Um, the last thing that, uh, not the last thing, but there's the other uh, good quality of, quality of life tool that I recommend you guys do. So you go in options, um, go into keyboard, and then what I recommend doing is going to this thing, uh, control D in keyboard, and um, Putting in this control D and the control D, uh, it, it's kind of typed out like exclamation point underscore zoom selected. So I'll give anyone who's following along a chance to add that. This is in the in the keyboard, the keyboard 
um, option within Rhino options. It's, it's different from aliases, but it's another uh, way to add shortcuts to your workflow. So this, this here is really useful, zoom selected. And I really like setting it to control D on my keyboard because what that does now is that if you select an object and hit control D, it just brings you to the object immediately. Control D. So that allows you to, again, it's all about moving around, moving around the model and getting to where you need to go much faster. So I'm moving my model now here, control D. Now you're at the object. So control D is a very easy to access um, um, keyboard because control D is just like a little bit, just pretty easy to access. So uh, it's right next to control S, which is save. Uh, so it's a very easy to access tool. So again, navigation, making sure that your workflow is, is super smooth and seamless. Like this will make your mastery of Rhino that much easier to, to do is if you just simply know how to move around fast and get around and then quickly do stuff in the model, like fill it objects, move things around, copy things, you know, you just need to, you need to be able to do everything as fast as possible so that you're not wasting time. Um, a few other things to learn. Um, the another, another thing to learn, so what I want everyone to do is if you're following along is to draw a circle. So on the left side, uh, there's a circle command right here that just allows you to draw a simple circle. Then select that circle, hit M on the keyboard to move it. You see how what you what, what's asking for is first is asking for some kind of reference point to move from. Um, and so you can click on an edge of it to move around. At the bottom of your Rhino workflow workspace here, there are these object snaps right here. You can see at the very bottom, you see it has end, near, point, mid, center, intersection. If you if if center is checked, that allows you to basically grab the center point of say for instance like a circle. So now if you hit move um, M on your keyboard, hit M to move. Now you can actually grab the center of the object. So now you're moving it via the center. And this is what I'm trying to teach you now. It's basically the whole point of like being able to move things around using snaps. So if you don't have any of these snaps turned on, if you disable them all the bottom and you move things around, you have, everything is basically unstructured. Like you can't move things and, and snap into objects. So you always want to make sure that, you know, decide when snapping is important to have. I would say 80% of the time, it's good to have snapping turned on. And so it allows you to say, for instance, you know, collect an object, hit M, then snap to the end, then move that to another object like so. So that just makes it easy to connect things or grab the midpoint. So if you have midpoint check um, in the box down, you can M, hit M. You can actually grab the midpoint of the object and then move it to something using uh, that like that. The other one that's most really useful to have is if you have intersecting objects. So let's say you wanna move the circle to the center, the intersection of like two lines. Intersection allows you to grab the area where they both intersect as well. So this is really similar to snapping in AutoCAD. Um, so if you use AutoCAD before, this is pretty similar to, to that. Perpendicular, if you check that box, what that allows you to do is if you draw a line, allows you to, you can see eventually, snap to a perpendicular point right there. So that's how you get the perfect perpendicular uh, line drawn um, in Rhino. I'm gonna take a quick breather. Any questions? Hopefully, is anyone following, following along or are people just like listening? Cause like the only way to learn is to just mess around in the tool and, and play around. We don't have to, we, we, have, we don't have any time to waste in our studio anymore. Like you need to just actually run into, go into Rhino, master the tools, play around, spin around the modeling space and get used to that. This is not, you can't learn this in a day. Let's put it that way. Um, it took me, it took me a long time to learn this tool.
Okay. Well, I hope we're, I hope we're all learning something. Um, so let's see. Let's a few other tools that are useful to, to know. Um, so the explode tool, um, again, very similar to a tool that you exist in AutoCAD. So if you have like a complex curve like this, you can type in explode, and then that takes that curve and it just breaks it out into its components like so. Before I exploded it, I just undo it a couple times. It's now one object. So exploding the object allows to take a complex object and break it into its segments. Um, a very common uh, thing to explode is say, for instance, for instance, a rectangle. So you can select a rectangle, type in explode, and then that takes the object and it breaks into its component parts like so. So a very useful um, tool to have. Um, I think what else? I mentioned this in a previous tutorial as well, is that as you, as you go through Rhino, I would highly recommend everyone practice using the middle mouse button. So if you click the middle mouse button, click it, it brings up a little um, mini toolbar that you can copy and copy all your most well, most um, commonly used tools in there. So again, again, this is all about making sure your workflow is fast and smooth. If you have all your tools immediately at your disposal, you don't have to move your hand to your keyboard and type in the tool. You can just simply have, you know, arc, you know, drawn. Or you can have three-point rectangle drawn, right? So you will eventually find the tools that you like to use the most. And what I highly recommend doing is once you find that tool, to find the button that's associated with the tool on the side, and then um, let's say, for instance, you want to draw, you draw a lot of rectangles, right? You can just take that tool, hold control on your keyboard and move it into your little um, toolbar. So then when you hit the middle mouse button there, it's always there um, at all times. So this is a fair, even a, probably even a faster way to work is to put your most commonly used tools in there because you don't have to move your hand to the keyboard to type in the shortcut. Can you really quickly do that again? How did low oh, my menu goes away whenever I try and drag that tool into it? So you hit you hit your min mouse button to bring up the thing. Um, it's going to go away if you if you it, it's all like it it hides once you click anywhere else, right? So what you do is you click on this little bar at the top, and then that kind of like holds it in place for a little bit, right? And then you can go in here and you can like. Uh, bring a tool in, let's say, for instance, this one right here. So then control, drag that into your toolbar there. And that's in there. Then just hit the little X button. That goes away. But now it's in there forever. So master, master your middle mouse button to have your most commonly used tools um, available at all times. You can see that I have some tools that I like to use. The vertical line tool is one that I use a lot. So this tool right here, um, it's located in the polyline command right here, there's this thing that looks like a, a line with two uh, for the green and a red um, line. That's the vertical line tool. And I like that because it allows me to very easily say, for instance, draw a five foot line. And so now I have a reference line that I know like from this line here, five foot up is, is right there. So I use the vertical line to draw, to draw a lot of reference lines in my model. Hey, Frank, how do you delete uh, things out of your pop-up thing? I accidentally copied a thing up. Uh, um, you can just hit uh, the move. So hold shift. So uh, control is copy, shift is move, you can just move it out. Okay. There it goes. So it's not, okay. it's not very intuitive, but like, you know, like this regular, like I don't want it, just hold shift, just move it out. See, so it just says delete. Okay. Then you click OK to delete. You are mastering Rhino, like your, the power is at your fingertips. Like all of a sudden you, you realize like once you master the tools, it's, it's, it's about making your hands like in control your model, right? Do you feel the power like, like surging through you now as you, as, you, as, you, as you get used to this? I hope you feel the power. Um, 
Okay, let me see some other basic tools that are important to know. Okay, we're gonna start. So what I've shown you guys now are like the basic curve, curve drawing tools, like how to edit and draw and that stuff. And so it's not it's just drawing, that's all it is. Um, but now we need to create objects. We need to create surfaces. We need to create things in 3D. So there are a few, a few tools that uh, you need to know. So the first one is, I'm gonna draw a line, right? So click on the line, you draw a shape. And then it, make sure that when you finish drawing the shape, you close it by just clicking at, back at the starting point like so. So what you've done is you you've, you've essentially created what's known as a closed curve. So if I select the object here, you see in the object window it says closed curve. If it's closed and it's planar, when I say planar, I mean basically it's all within one elevation. You can turn that into a surface by using a tool called planar surface. So you select the object, you type in planar surface. You see the command line like, like I have right there. Um, I haven't talked about the, 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 the views yet, but you probably would be in like shaded or wireframe view. Um, if you go to the, you, your viewport might look, look something like this to maximize any of these viewports. You just double click on the name of the viewport. So if it's a perspective, you just, just double click on that, that, uh, brings you into that, um, fills up the entire viewport. Then to go back to the grid view, just double click on it again. And um, you probably have most of these views um, in your model, wireframe, shaded, rendered. Most people usually stick with shaded um, as their standard modeling viewport. Um, rendered gives you a, a view of objects, but with the textures rendered. Um, for now, just stick, stick with shaded. Um, what I did here is you can see how the my geometry is, is yellow. I assume if you drew your geometry, it's not yellow. And what I did was I need to do this because I'm always importing my models into Infoworks. And Infoworks always distinguishes between front faces and back faces in geometry. And that's one thing about modeling that is um, kind of a confusing thing to understand, but everything within 3D geometry, if it's not a closed object, has a front and a back. And the backs are always geometry that we want to make sure are orientated behind objects. So right now, the back of this surface here is facing up, it's looking at me. And so what you need to use, you need to, if that happens, is I type in flip and that makes the object uh, face oriented correctly. This, you see, so now the bottom is yellow and the top is, is gray. That I'll talk about this more detail later, but this is, this is something that comes in really, really handy when you're ever, you're dealing with geometry that you're bringing to say Infoworks or 3ds Max or other programs is that you always make sure that you have your faces orientated in the correct direction. And if it's not, you need to type in flip on the keyboard to flip the orientation of the object so that the front is always um, looking up. So uh, anyway, back to the main point, if you have a geometry that is flat and closed, you can type in planar surface and that turns it into a surface like so. If the geometry is not closed, let's say um, I explode this and remove one edge, planar surface does not work. If it is closed, but it's not planar, let's say one of the curves is doing that and that, planar surface, does not work because the, the um, geometry is not uh, planar. So when an object is not planar, what do you do? You set point, so SS. And now it's planar, so now you can use planar surface. The next tool that is most commonly used um, in our work is loft. So loft allows you to take Curves that are, let's say I just draw three random curves like so. Curves that are kind of represent cross sections and basically link them together and create a surface through them. So if I, if I, I just drew in three quick curves like so, like you see right here, if I type in loft on my keyboard, you can select one, two, 
hit enter and it draws a surface in between the two curves. But you can also string together multiple curves as well. So if I type in loft, click one, two, three, then that lofts together three curves together and you can create a surface in that way. Keep in mind that when you use loft, that the where you click on the curve matters. So if I click, you can see if I click on the bottom of this curve here, the top of this curve here, and the bottom of this curve here, like that now like flips the orientation of the, the loft. So it doesn't look quite right. So whenever you're, you're doing loft, try to select the curve at the end, at the same end across the entire surface to create um, um, a simple loft like that. So loft is a very commonly used command that we use to create general surfaces. And I'll show you guys how we can use that in an actual landscape project later in the tutorial. Um, another one we use quite a lot is sweep. So let's say you, for instance, have, I, mean, I clicked on this control point curve right here. You have a curved line like so. Let me delete these ones here. Sweep allows us to take this cross section curve right here and um, basically sweep it along another curve like you see it here. So if you type in sweep, there's like sweep one and sweep two. Let's do sweep one first. So I type in sweep one. First, we need to do is we need to select the rail. So this is the rail. That's the curve that is uh, this cross section is going to follow. So I select on that as my rail, and then it asks for selecting a cross section curve. So you select on that and hit enter. So then it basically creates a sweep along that curve here. You can see like when it reaches like a really tight corner like this, it doesn't quite work that well. So what that's telling me is that this curve may need to be adjusted a little bit. Let's say a little bit less intense of a, of a kink. Maybe delete some of these vertices to make it smoother. And now if you type in sweep, select the rail, select the cross section curve, you create nice smooth geometry like so. Another thing you can do as well is um, the, this cross section does not have to be flat. So let's say I insert edit points. So I type in insert edit point. And I just added a, two, a few uh, control points within this. Then I type in PP to bring in the, um, actually let me try to get insert edit point. Enter PP, there we go. Uh, you can now basically create 3D geometry, 3D cross sections. So now if I type in sweep, you can now create like 3D elements in 3D, say for instance, seat walls or berms or elements like that. So everything usually when we model stuff always starts in terms of like curves. And curves, what is a curve? A curve is just a section. So what we, what we really were doing is we're drawing sections and we're turning the sections into 3D geometry. Um, another example is, let's say for instance, you draw a, um, a rectangle. So um, one tool that you, you can use a lot is the vertical rectangle tool. So on the left side here, there's this vertical rectangle tool right here. Um, I get to that by in the rectangle button, there's a little arrow right next to the rectangle. If you click on that, that brings up this uh, vertical rectangle tool. So now you can do is you can click there and do like type in, if you type in a number, um, it constrains the, the length of this to the, whatever number you're drawing. So let's say 1.5. So now what we've done is we, we've created like this 1.5 foot high um, seat wall. Almost. It's gonna be a huge seat wall, but you will see what I mean. Um, this is not a cross section. So if I type in sweep one, That creates a piece of 3D geometry that you can um, say, for instance, model a wall or whatever. And it's yellow because it's it's uh, it's um, not closed and also it's facing the wrong direction. So the way you fix that, if you see this, um, well, you won't see that because you you won't have the yellow. But um, you can either cap it, so type in cap to close it, or uh, flip it. So type in flip, and that flips it as well. But you see, if I flip it, the inside of it is still hollow. So capping it fixes that. So if I type in cap, that just closes everything and creates a solid piece of geometry.
It was fun, right? Learning how to model stuff with great IE. And, you know, this is a, you know, think about this, like, I'm just showing you squares, but you know, you can take that square, you can copy it. You can create like little fun little, once you get good at this, you can create little like seat wall elements, right? And then you can create objects that like have like that sun fun little seat wall profile to it, right? They can join that, then sweep. And I've created a little seat wall. So like modeling is easy once you, once you learn the technique and learn the method. So now I've created a little seat wall that, you know, kind of similar to what I showed you guys at the project in St. Louis. Another thing you can do is you can do two curves. So right now I am, let me actually make this a little bit smaller because it's ridiculously big. Uh, just make it smaller like so. One thing that I didn't talk about is there's a gumball command, a gumball tool. So if you select any object, you may or may not have this uh, RGB uh, thing turned on. If, you, if it's not turned on, just look at the bottom of your um, Rhino modeling space. There's a thing called Gumball. If that's not uh, visible, just click on that and it turns it on. I like having this on because it's a very easy way for me to select objects, move things around, constrain them to a certain direction, or um, scale things. You see, for instance, if I click on these little handles here, it allows me to scale things down. But if I hold the shift command, the shift key while I drag that, it actually scales it uniformly in one direction. So I'm just going to do this real quick. I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to copy that curve over and rotate it. We're going to do something really weird. We're going to do something really weird. We're going to create a, a, a sweep that has a, a changing profile. So not, now we're going to use this thing called sweep two. So type in sweep, and you see a sweep one, sweep, sweep one, and sweep two. If I type in sweep two, you can, you can choose two rails. So now I'll choose rail one, then rail two, and then cross section curve, enter, enter. Now I can create like, like geometry that has a little bit more of a um, graceful shape to it. And again, um, my, my stuff is yellow because I have like the back faces turned on. Ignore the yellow. If you ever see the yellow, I'll explain that later. So now I can create fun, more fun geometry just based off of, see what we modeled was basically two curves and a cross section. And just those two small little elements, you can create really fun, dynamic looking, say for instance, seat wall elements, planter elements, that kind of thing. And Frank, you typed both sweep one and sweep two just then? I'll show you, I'll show you one real quick. So type in sweep. I, I didn't even finish typing in sweep. Like I type in S-W-E-E -E, and it gives me a bunch of suggestions. So it gives me a suggestion of sweep one or sweep two. So. I click on sweep two to get the sweep two option. So it's like the first rail, it's like the second rail, it's like the cross section curve, hit enter. Um, I need to enter again. And you can see here, like um, it gives you a couple of options in, in sweep two. There's this thing called maintain height that could be useful um, on certain things. So if you, if you check that box here, you see it, uh, it doesn't scale the, the section as, as, the, as the rails split apart. It actually kind of like deforms the section a bit. So that gives you something like this, where the, let's say this bench here starts here, but then splits out and does that. And then, but the actual height of itself maintains its, itself across the entirety of the, of the uh, object. So when you look at, you know, all the, the big name landscape architecture firms and their fancy schmancy planter seat walls made out of concrete, this is all they're doing. They're just, they're just playing around with rhino and modeling stuff like this. And what's fun is you can take these 
models. You can send it, send it to a concrete fabricator and then they'll take that model and they'll create form lighters on all that. So, you know, the modeling is, is, is just, just handy to, you know, be able to uh, give to fabricators and they can model these really expensive concrete seat walls that look cool on paper, but are really uncomfortable to sit on. So, but you know, that's, that's okay. Things you learn, things you learn as you design is that sometimes the simpler, simpler the design, the better the design. Um, okay, so that's sweep. I'm going to show you one last tool. Uh, there's a bunch of other tools. And as you dive into your projects, you know, hopefully I'll, I'll begin to see what everyone's doing. And I can teach you guys more tools that are more specific to each of your um, uh, things. But I have a, there's one, one technique that I've used. I probably use this particularly more than any other technique. And it's a, a technique that is unintuitive. And, um, but once you learn this technique it actually makes, um, modeling in Rhino super fun and easy because you can you can draw really bad but get good results and so here's what I mean this is basically oh you know I'm drawing my site plan and I, I think there are some lines that I need to that like you know like directional lines that re represent something and maybe you know I think the design should do something like that I don't I just don't want to have time to like make it very clean um design you know you, you you come up with like some sketchy some sketch to your design and you, you have like this rough idea like there should be something there um i just want to like just kind of get a feel for what it looks like because i'm just doing something like that so what can i do with this this mess of lines here what you can do is you can select everything you can type in the hatch command and you can begin to hatch certain areas uh, in between um the curves that you drew right if they enter um it gives you a bunch of these hatch patterns that you can use but you should always choose the solid option the solid option right here so now i've created these solid hatches and then what you do is if you take the solid hatch you type in explode that turns a hatch into a surface so this is a very very quick way to take bad sketches and turn them into actual modeling. So you can actually like create closed surfaces within the hatches. So, so you can, for instance, you can take these surfaces. Now you can extrude them out, extrude surface. You can create actual like elements from your bad sketch, right? Whether these are seat walls or whatever. And you see, like, it doesn't, doesn't require me to like actually do anything in terms of taking that cleaning it up, trimming it. I just need to get a quick idea out the door as fast as possible. So using the hatch tool, so again, selecting an object, hatch, you can very quickly get some ideas modeled by using this, exploding it, and you get actual surfaces. And then what you can do as well is you can take these, these um, Surfaces, you can type in what's called duplicate border, so DUP border, and now you've you grabbed actual like line work from bad sketches. So again, this is the whole point I'm trying to say is that you gotta be able to like use Rhino creatively. You gotta be able to like think like you're sketching in a sketchbook. And so when you're sketching in a sketchbook, you're just drawing lines. You're not really thinking what the lines mean. Uh, maybe maybe the lines are just like a couple of curves that do something like that. You know, like that's an idea. You're not sure, exactly sure what it is yet, but you know, you have an idea for something and then think, all right, well, I think that there could mean something. So you, you turn into geometry, explode it. And now you have actual geometry that you can use. You see how like once you master like the, the, the tools, like it's almost instantaneous how quickly it can turn into actual geometry. And then, you know, maybe, you know, you can say this is say, you know, uh, let's say, let, let's say, I'm going to undo this. Let's say there's another curve here and that represents something. So you hatch that. Like this is now a surface and that's a surface. It's now you have a transition between the two. So you can loft the two, loft the transition between the two right here. Um, so my new dupe edge. And you can create 
lofts between the edges. I'm gonna create like, begin to like model stuff in 3D really quickly based off a crappy sketch. Modeling, modeling should be fun. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be a chore. And so when I want, when I want to emphasize with the whole technique I'm trying to show here is that you can just have ideas that are generic. You can spend, you know, a good chunk of your process just sketching in the top view, in plan view of an idea like this. And then at some point, translate that into a 3D model. Um, now, obviously, you're going to want to draw with precision and, and care, but uh, it is also possible to think of this uh, creatively and loosely at the same time as well. Hey, Frank. Yes. How do you turn off projected point? Projected point? Yeah. Where at one? Go ahead. Uh, I, I'm, a little, I'm not sure what you mean, projected point, like what's happening on your model? It's like if I, it's like snapping to a point above the actual geometry. Um, maybe uncheck point and object snap down here. No, I, I don't, I'll figure it out, Never mind. Yeah, uh, you can also try unchecking smart track. No. I think it's uncheck project. <laughs> uncheck project. Possibly, yeah. All right. We've mastered Rhino, right? We've we've I've shown you I've shown you like a lot of basic techniques that allow you to build objects and geometries in in Rhino. Um, I'm going to, let's do this. Let's take a quick five minute break. Um, I need to quickly grab some water. Um, so, uh, but we'll come back. Let's say it's 10, 15, 10, 14, 10, 15. So let's come back at 10, 20. I'm going to pause the, pause the recording and we'll be back in five minutes. All right. So, um, the next thing I want everyone to do, if you have the workshop three model open, is to again go to the options. And then in the view at the very um, a very bottom of the Rhino options here, there's a thing called a view and then called display modes. And then there's an import button right there. So click on import. And in the, the download box folder that I've given you, there should be a folder, a thing called shaded texture. And I want you to take that file and open it and import it into this uh, list of display modes here. And so then you should have a thing called shaded texture in your display modes. And what that does is it should create another uh, uh, display mode in this list here. And I, I created this mode called shaded texture, which is essentially a, a low um, CPU, GPU intensive viewing mode that puts textures on objects. If you say, for instance, go to a rendered mode, uh, like right, right here, you know, this looks nice, um, but you can see it actually has to render, render shadows and render like the soft lighting around objects. Uh, my cat is going crazy in the background, so sorry about that. Um, but I use shaded texture because it turns off all the, the lighting, and but it still allows us to observe the textures. So this mode here is a mode that I use, shaded texture, when I'm just modeling stuff in 3D, but I still want Rhino to run fast and smooth and not have to render all the lighting. So that's why I've, why I've given you that, that, uh, that mode there. Um, in the layers panel on the side, you see how I have these different materials for different uh, layers, wood, concrete, grass, paving. And each rectangle that I've drawn here, uh, each box I've drawn is on a different layer. So this is a technique that you can use to quickly begin to put materials on things that you draw in 3D. 
is to just simply set a material to the layer itself. So let me show you how that works. So let's create a new layer. So in the layers panel here, you create a new layer by clicking on this new layer button, like so. And let's call this one, uh, I'm trying to think, let's call it paving, let's call it brick, call it brick. And then what we're gonna do is we're going to give it a color. So uh, in the color, this doesn't mean anything. This just means how it looks in the model space. So you click on this little square right here and it should bring a, a color selection tool that you see right here. If you don't see the wheel here, you can click on the color wheel to get that. And let's just pick like a red color, whatever. So now we have a brick layer. And then in the material column next to it, you should, you should be able to see a material column. You can click on the little circle and you actually, actually set a material to that layer. So when you have the material window pulled up, what you want to do is you want to go to this type here and choose custom. That brings up a bunch, bunch of options. The name, let's call it brick. And then what you do is you put a texture to this material. So in texture down here, there's this thing called color. Click on the three dots, this button right here, three dots, these. And that brings up um, a window where you can begin to select a material. So if you downloaded the textures folder that I gave you, you should see all these textures that I've given you. And these are textures I've used in renderings and models and stuff throughout my career. And I'm just giving them all to you. And hopefully you'll find something useful in there um, that you can use. So choose one of the brick patterns. Let's just choose this one, for instance, click open and then click okay. So now anything that's drawn on this layer here will have a brick texture. So let's, let's test that. So I'm just gonna click on a box like so. And now it immediately has a, a brick texture associated with it. You can also do this as if you uh, say, for instance, this object right here, let's make a copy of it. So what I'm gonna do is gonna type in CC to move it. This object is still on the this paving layer right here, but you can select an object, like another object, like any object in the model space, and then right click on the layer that you want to move it to. So right click on brick, then click on the skin called change object layer. So now these objects are on brick. So this is a very easy way to begin to take your, your items that you model in, in, in Rhino and quickly associate them with the material and then quickly have the material immediately visualize itself on the surface itself. Um, the reason why this is handy is just because like being able to see what the thing looks like instantly just makes everything a lot more easy to understand what you're doing. And so that's how I recommend you organize your layers. It's not to organize your layers in terms of like objects like bench, uh, chair, wall, paving, but instead to ob or organize it in terms of material. So like I said, wood, concrete, grass. Um, well, in this case, like we'll just call it like paving type one or whatever, brick. And that's how you actually, that's how you actually should organize your, your um, layers is by the material. Cause then it's easy to associate the material with the actual um, geometry itself. So let's say for instance, you wanna draw a lawn panel, um, you can, uh, choose one of the surface drawing tools, let's say, for instance, the rectangle surface, and you draw on the grass layer, you immediately have a grass surface. If you, if you double click on paving and then draw a surface in paving, you've drawn, you've drawn a paving area. Double click on brick, draw a surface in that, you have a brick surface. Oh, this one needs to be grass. Right click, change object layer. And so, you know, just these are the ways that you can begin to associate geometry with um, actual uh, materials really quickly and really easily. And is then it also, possible? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Is it possible to change the scale of the like textures that are being applied? Like, if those bricks seem massive, is it possible to scale down so that it like repeats more often depending on what you're working on? Correct. Yes, there is a way to do that. Uh, you're you are asking the right questions, and we'll we'll uh, get to that eventually. But since you asked, basically, 
if you select an object, it's all about texture mapping. So go to the properties tab here, and then there's a tab below the properties tab called texture mapping. And then this allows you to adjust how the texture basically fits within this service as hell. So the easiest way to say, for instance, like increase the density of this material is just repeat it a few times. And so down here, this is UD, UVW repeat. Right now it's set to 111. Basically this texture is filling out each corner um, exactly, but repeating it, let's say put four, four, that can begin to um, scale it so that it fills out in a, in a way that's a bit more realistic. Um, there are ways later down the road, let's say you want, you actually want this to be a real size brick dimension that we can get into doing that. But let's for nine times out of 10, you just need, it just needs to look right. It doesn't need to be exactly 100% scaled correctly. So as long as it looks somewhat right, you've, you'll be fine. Just because again, what we're creating are modeling models for renderings. And, uh, and as long as it looks right, let's say at, at like an elevation view, like it looks somewhat realistic, then you've, you've done, you've done your job. Um, so that's texture mapping. Um, there are other, there's a bunch of other texture maps in here that you can play with. Um, but the one that is probably the one I use most are is either surface mapping, which is the default or planar mapping. So planar mapping, if I click on that, uh, that allows you to draw a reference box that the map is associated with it. So let's say you want the, the bricks to be rotated in a certain direction. You can use the planar map to uh, uh, change that. And then you can obviously do, still, still do, do the repeat. So let's take that four, four, you can do something like that. Texture, so texture mapping is, is super important to do, um, but you see how it really helps take the design and actually makes, makes it visual. So what we're gonna do now is we're going to try modeling something in 3D. We're gonna actually try to model a greenway section. And so in this workshop, um, the workshop template file that I'm giving you, there's a layer called section. So I'm gonna click on that layer and then check, turn it on. And you see that there is a little bit of a greenway section drawn there. So uh, this greenway section is drawn in the uh, front view. So in the bottom uh, left of your Rhino viewport, you have the top view, front view, right view. Click on front. And that basically takes the camera and just moves it to a projected view so that we see everything like on the front. So this is like literally a section now. Um, this section is basically a 12 foot wide path with a one foot uh, curb on either end. We're just drawing sections now. So this is nothing, this is not rocket science. So I'm going to double click on section here and we're just going to play around for a bit. Let's imagine that this is a greenway and let's imagine, say for instance, the greenway next to, um, let's say a, uh, um, a creek. And let's say that's that greenway is on the other side has a little bit of a a swale next to it. Um, you can even draw using the, the curve command as well to give, give a nice smoother look to it. And let's say it has like a, some kind of condition like this. I'm actually gonna draw the, this curve as a smoother curve. And let's say, you know, you're looking at this and you actually think, well, I, you know, I'm, I think there might be Let's say at certain points along this thing, there might be like a seat wall. So you can do um, 1.5, 1.5 by 1.5 foot seat wall right next to the, to the path. And this is, this is literally, you know, the assignment that I'm giving you guys to do is this is to draw a typical section through your site. And so I'm drawing this arbitrarily at this point right now, but you would draw your section um, based on the actual dimensions and measurements that you are dealing with, whether it has you know, some kind of swale next to it, whether it has a rail next to it, whether it's a, actually an urban condition with a street next to it. Um, 
But once you have your section, then you can just use all the tools that we've I've shown you. And you can say, for instance, use sweep, extrusions, you can use surfaces. So the simplest tool to use is, a, is an extrusion. So what we do now is I'm gonna create a new layer, call this one section 3D, set that to be the current layer. Then I'm gonna select all these objects and type in extrude curve. And then that allows you to take that section and turn it into an actual site section. Then let's say for instance, you have a surface that is uh, flipped in the incorrect direction, just on flip, flip that, so that's correct. And then what you can do is then you can take these objects here and actually set materials to those objects. So let's say these two objects here, you wanna put into the planted layer. So I take those two sections there, I change that to the grass layer. So change object layer, now it's on grass. You take this here, you wanna change it to say the paving layer. So change that, change object layer to paving. Take these wall layers here, change that to concrete. And then uh, as I showed you with the other thing, the, the texture mapping uh, technique, take uh, say for instance, the paving layer right there, go to the texture mapping uh, function here and just increase the number of If, uh, if it's not working, like it's for some reason I'm choosing the texture mapping, it's not repeating, then just do a planar map. So I click on the surface here, just to, just choose uh, planar map, choose like bounding box, C plane, UV, and then you can choose, you can change the numbers here and it should begin to repeat it. And you just, you just mess with these numbers until it looks somewhat correct. Frank, how do you, how did you get to all these options? These? The ones uh, you see? Like under proper, how did you get to texture mapping, I guess? So you click on the object, you go to the properties tab at the very top, the one that looks like a rainbow circle. And then below that tab, there's are these other tabs as well. And then the texture mapping tab is this one that looks like a piece of wallpaper, checkered board wallpaper. Yeah. Okay. I didn't have the thing select, like the object selected. Yep. So what we're doing now is we're basically taking like what was once a simple section and we're turning it into a 3D section, just using, using a simple extrusion. And then we're taking the objects that uh, were built in 3D and then we're applying texture to them. So take these walls, for instance, we got to adjust the texture map for these. So planar map is one you can use. You can also use box mapping. So click on box mapping for these walls here. Click bounding box, C plane. Yes. And now you've creating a texture map across the entire surface of this and you can increase the um, number of repeated values for this. So let's do like five, 50, let's do five, yeah. That looks okay. Actually, no, let's do this. Frank, I'm sorry, I keep missing it when you do it, but how are you uh, increasing the number of like pavers on the sidewalk and things like that? So, uh, what I do is basically click on object, like for instance, this right here, right? And what you need to do is you need to apply a map to it. So surface mapping, planar mapping, box mapping. Um, the one that I'm using for this is a planar map. So what that basically means is this, is that if I click on planar map, what it's doing is it's taking a rectangular plane that re represents the texture and simply just, um, placing it vertically down onto the surface itself. Um, so what you can do is this, is let's say 
uh, you can draw, and we go into to a top view like here, you can draw a box that represents the texture map. Now you can now basically what you've created is essentially a uh, a field of pavers that utilizes a texture map within that box that I've I've drawn. And then it then just takes that box and simply just repeats it in a grid um, all across this field here. Um, one way to visualize this is to simply when you have an object selected and you have the texture mapping tab selected, you can click on this box here called Show Mapping, and it shows basically this little pink box right here. If I move that box, you see how that, that moves like the texture around the thing here? If I scale the box, you see how it makes everything smaller? Basically that box right there represents the JPEG, the actual image itself, whatever the texture looks like, it fits within that box. And then simply just tiling it across, infinitely across the entire rest of the space there. So one way to adjust it is to do it like I'm just showing right now, which is to simply just adjust it like so, adjust the actual texture map. You can even rotate the texture map if you want to as well, to rotate the direction of it. Or if you hide this, hide this map, when, you actually, when you've applied a texture map, you can just repeat it a few times. So in here, repeat. So these are just like a bunch of different ways that you can adjust the, the look of the feel of the paving on a surface. It just requires you to play around with it a few times and you eventually get it. Uh, once, you, once you mess with it a few times, it, it'll make sense. So this section that I've made right here, it looks really simple and really dumb, but that's because it was a very simple and really dumb section that we just simply extruded out. But eventually, as you begin to build more detail into your section, you know, with more elements such as um, other types of elements of the section, whether it's not just the greenway itself, maybe it's some kind of um, deck or uh, an element that is built off of it, you can actually add more and more detail to this itself. And not everything has to be, say, for instance, in a, a continuous, to continuous extrusion. Let's say, for instance, this little seat wall here, um, you want it to actually be a seat wall that is repeated a few times, you can do something else like that. So this is, what I'm showing you now is just very simply like the design process at this point. It's now basically taking what is what starts out as a section and beginning to build that into some 3D elements using the extrusion commands and all other tools that I've shown you. Um, eventually what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this object here um, and we're going to render it using Enscape. So uh, what you can do now, you know, if you've done, if you've gotten up to this point here, it looks fairly dumb and simple, but um, let me just repeat this bench a few more times just to fill out this section. And obviously, you know, you're, we're not gonna propose grass, grassy swales, we're gonna do something different, but I just wanna, you know, show you the, what happens when you, when you turn on Enscape. So, if you have Enscape installed, um, you should have uh, an Enscape toolbar on the top here. If you don't see the Enscape toolbar, you can right click on the toolbar at the top and then in show toolbar, you should be able to find Enscape down here and just make sure that Enscape is checked. You can bring the Enscape toolbar. So choose the Enscape, start Enscape in a separate window button. So just click on that and that's gonna fire up Enscape. Again, uh, Enscape is installed on the virtual workstations um, provided by Auburn. So um, if Enscape is not working well for you, you can always um, use that. One thing I, I do kind of want to show you guys is that, you know, once you actually build stuff in 3D, it doesn't, it, even though like this is a really dumb uh, section, it already just due to the fact that you've added textures to it, um, that you've built things in 3D, it already is kind of taking you there. Like this is maybe, I would say 25% of the way there. It needs more detail in terms of, of uh, like actually objects and planting and site furnishings. But the very fact that you have actual texture, the fact you actually have materiality, the very fact you actually have lighting associated with it, like this takes you almost that close to an actual site section. And you can see like, I didn't spend that much time on it. But you can already begin to see like with a little bit more time and care, you can actually develop 
a little greenway section um, as part of your design. One thing that you will need to do is like, as you are creating your section is you might at some point, let's say for instance, this is your view that you like. Um, if you have a view that you really like and that you've found an endscape, you can save that view by going into the view management button right here. And then choosing this create view. And then you can give it a name, endscape name view one, that's fine, just click create. And then what happens in Rhino is that you see Enscape name view has populated into the uh, a name view tab right here. So the name view tab is a, is a camera tab that allows you to um, um, have bookmark views. So now you've essentially saved the same exact angle that was in Enscape in Rhino as well. So you can export out Rhino line work and an Enscape render, and you can overlay them on top of each other and the views match perfectly. And so I'll show you uh, at the end of this tutorial, how can you begin to export line work out from both um, the Rhino viewport and the Enscape viewport, and then begin to compose things into, into a section later on. But you can see essentially we've created a section, a 3D section of a greenway. It, it's not very good at this point because it's really simple, but what we can, we can begin to do is um, you know, manipulate the lighting condition. So to manipulate the lighting, um, what you want to do is hold shift on your keyboard and then drag with the right mouse button. And then you can actually adjust the actual lighting of what this looks like. And you're going to want to, do, like, if you, if you ask me, go for something that's really dramatic and something really um, cool looking, so make nice long shadows so that uh, it's, it's nice and dramatic. Um, I haven't talked to talk to you guys that much about Enscape, but you know what you should do is you should go into this uh, visual settings button right here and play around with all of these, these different visualization settings that you can use to make the model look cool. So uh, it has this thing called outlines right here. If it's set to 0%, there are no outlines, but if you see that as I begin to move the slider to the right, all of a sudden like little lines are beginning to outline along the model itself. And that's like a nice, way to make the design a lot more clear um, in the design. So you can, you can choose to have that or not. It's up to you. Decide how you want it to look. Um, rendering quality down here, right now it's set to medium. I highly recommend just sticking at medium. When you go to high or ultra, uh, ultra is completely unnecessary. That almost, it just takes up too much of your computer resources and it doesn't look significantly better. Medium like pretty much looks great. So um, stay at medium, if you ask me. If you want to have a little bit of extra like, uh, detail in, your, in your terms of reflective materials, you can, just, you can set it to high, but medium is a good uh, place to stay at. Um, in image here, you can begin to adjust things like saturation, color temperature, motion blur, uh, bloom, all these things. So for instance, if I take bloom, move the slider up, it gives everything that like really dreamy quality to it, if that's what you're going for. If not, just simply move it back. You can always reset by clicking on the little thing that looks like a arrow and that kind of re re resets everything. Uh, color temperature, this is where you can begin to like make it so that maybe right now it's, it's a very warm color. Maybe you just watched Dune and you said, I want everything to have like a very sandy, warm color to it. And so you move this all the way to the, to the left. But then, you know, you, you stop watching Dune and you realize actually real life doesn't look like that. And so you move it back to like something closer to the right. And so then saturation, you know, you can crank up the saturation or crank down the saturation. I generally recommend you crank down a saturation like maybe 80%, uh, just because like overly saturated rendering, it just looks super fake. And we're going for realism. So, you know, real life is a little bit less saturated than you think. So maybe like 80% is probably um, a good place to, to play around. But play around with that, that slider and, and get something um, that looks good. Obviously, you know, you don't have to set everything in Enscape. You can always just adjust the look and feel in Photoshop uh, later because you're going to export this out and compose it in there. So Frank, I, I know we're going for realism, but I'm just curious if there's a way to customize um, outlines in either Enscape or um, InfraWorks. Outlines, you mean, what do you mean? Sorry, there's some hammering happening here. Um, 
like in the sense of uh, like stylization, like if you want it to look like a drawing or a, I don't know, a, an unusual kind of line. Like, uh, like kind of like what I was showing here with the outlines where like they're like outlines around objects. Yes. Yeah, you can do that. I mean, what I'll show you guys how to do is basically how to take line work from Rhino and get overlay on top of landscape and then any alignment that you export out of Rhino, you can edit in Illustrator and, and do that kind of thing. Gotcha, thanks. Um, I'm, I'm not opposed to like choosing stylistic, making stylistic choices for your uh, rendering, but keep in mind this, this general rule of thumb is that, and I mentioned this when we talk about GRG projects, um, is that you always want to represent your project in such a way where it looks implementable. It looks like it can be done. And sometimes overlay, overly stylized renderings that you know, don't look, you know, like the, the project that uh, Site Design Group showed us with their Riverfront Ideas uh, plan, which was super graphic, almost like a comic book. Um, that's fun and conceptual and really cool, but we know that that's never going to happen. And what we want to do is we want uh, River Region Trails to have something, visual assets that looks like it could happen. And that is how you generate generate interesting projects. It's like if people look at a rendering saying, actually, I think that could happen. So keep that in mind if you're choosing to go stylistic. Um, one thing that uh, you will notice in here in the output is that you can set the resolution to whatever the rendering output resolution will be. For your section that you're gonna do, uh, it doesn't really matter that much as long as it, it's uh, it, the entirety of the model is, is within the view. But when you actually do your rendering itself, the actual rendering, I highly recommend that you do a uh, cinematic aspect ratio. So uh, a, re a resolution like this, like 6700 by 2800 pixels, that gives you an aspect ratio of, of 2.39, which is like a cinematic aspect ratio. So what that, what that means is this, is basically you can click on this safe frame button here and that like brings the actual, like actual, um, um, rendered area of your model um, in, in, the, in the frame. And then if you go into the model and like stand there, you can begin to see like it begins to have that, that cinematic quality to it. Again, I go, I recommend going for cinematic widescreen aesthetics because it just feels like you're there. It feels like you're in a movie. It feels like you're in the space as opposed to say, for instance, something that like looks like this, which is a bit more of a square um, view, I think, I think this is, is uh, if you ask me, whenever I do renderings, I always go for a cinematic um, ratio like this, whoops. Also, one thing you can do is um, if you're in the, if you're in Enscape, sorry, I'm spinning around. If you hit uh, space on your keyboard, like that drops you down to the surface and then you can walk around the model like you're playing a video game. But if you walk off of the surface, you basically fall and just you know fall to the fall to your death. So, and if you hit if you hit space on your keyboard again, then you can fly. So you can fly above it. And then hit space on your keyboard, to like drop onto it. But you have to like hit it. There we go. Um. So close out of Enscape. And then what you do at this point is basically you have your model here and you can need to begin to add assets to your model. So furniture, planting, um, any object element that you think you want to design um, as part of it. So let's, uh, there are a few ways you can do that. Um, obviously is to, one way is to go into the Enscape asset library. So um, that's this button Rhino there. So if you open that, opens up this, um, Enscape asset library, and then you can bring in things like trees, scale figures, anything. Um, and, you know, a lot of students, you guys were asking me, like, how do I put trees in my model for my whole site? And this is what I was basically trying to get us to is that we don't need to model the entire site. We just need to model a small little section of your grooming. And that's how you manage, manage your files. Like if you're, if you're modeling a typical section, typical section, you can easily um, place trees within this small little area and not have to do the whole thing. Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to show like, this is what it typically looks like for the majority of the stretch of your greenway. So you can add trees here. So 
Well, what I recommend doing is whenever you're creating uh, Enscape assets is to create a new layer in Rhino and call it Enscape. If it's trees, call it Enscape trees. Then set that to be your current layer. And then go in here and find um, the model that most accurately represents either existing conditions or uh, a, a tree that you're proposing on uh, your site. So let's just find a tree to add for this demo. And ground cover as well is also pretty key as well. So there's actually some pretty nice ground cover assets in here as well. So, you know, let's say you want to add, you know, some um, ground cover assets. So click on the surface, you can add um, a bush. And you see like how I use my control D zoom selected tool to quickly, you know, add the object and go to it to see where it is and where it sits on the site. Then you can use the copy tool to quickly copy assets. So if you select objects, move things using the gumball and hit alt on your keyboard, that is a quick way to begin to copy assets very fast. And then you can just simply multiply that several times and all of a sudden you've, uh, you've added a couple of ground cover plantings to your model pretty easily. Let's add a couple of trees to this model. So let's find a, a nice looking tree. And because we're modeling everything in surfaces, the, the asset should snap directly to the surface. You can see like it just immediately snapped right on top of it. And then we can do is basically just copy it over a few times and then to avoid the repeating tree look, you know, just take a tree and just rotate it a little bit like so, rotate it like so, so that it's not, when you actually go into Enscape, it doesn't have the aesthetic of something just repeating multiple times. It will look like it's repeating here several times. So, you know, you might need to rotate a few of those just to add a little bit of that variation to the, to the area. Then let's add a, add a scale figure in the model. So go to people. And let's add a person sitting down. So I control D again, how useful is the zoom selected? It allows you to quickly move to uh, uh, an object you've modeled and quickly um, put that and adjust that in the space. And then you can add other scale figures as well. Let's say add a cyclist, you know, like so. So now you've added your assets. And then let's go to Enscape. And also before you do anything else, always remember to go to the save button right here and hit save because you forget to save. That's the sound of your model exploding and crashing. And also your dreams dying as well because uh, if your model explodes, then um, you fail. So let's open Enscape and see how that looks now. See, this is fun. Like once you once you have materials and you have objects you're placing around, like you can like you can very quickly visualize an idea. Um, and then see it in 3D and add lighting to it, and uh, it's fun. And that's that's the goal, is that like I said earlier, like you should be having fun at this stage of the project. It's just meant to be interactive and meant to be playful. It's meant to be um, enjoyable. So this is, isn't too fancy, but you, know, you can see very easily, you know, you can begin to visualize what it might look like. It just, you know, just continue to work on it, continue to add some detail. One thing you will notice, and maybe maybe it's it's a little interesting, is that the grass actually has a little bit of furriness to it. You can see how the grass like actually has this interesting grass texture. So this is a little trick that Enscape has: is that basically if you have if you have a layer in the material uh, panel here, let's say uh, right here, if it's called actually called grass, it actually 
reads that and turns it into grass. So let me show you how that looks. Let's let's take this grass layer here and let's rename it, call it not grass, not, you know, whatever, not grass, okay? Then let's change, take this, uh, this uh, paving layer here and let's call this grass. You see what happened is that it took that paving layer and it turned into, like it turned it fuzzy, but then it took the, the grass texture and it, it removed the fuzziness to it. So it's a, it's a thing that Enscape does is that it basically takes the layer that is called grass and it reads that and it says, all right, that's gonna be fuzzy now. And so even though the paving layer is not paving, um, I called it grass. So let's call that paving again. Quick, quick, okay. Let's go back to the grass layer. Call it grass. Then go back to Enscape and you see it should instantly fix it. And so now that the, the grass looks like that, and then maybe you say to yourself, actually, you know, I think that just looks bad in general. So then you just go back to the grass layer and just call it planting. And then just remove the fuzziness all entirely. So maybe you decide, you know what, that's just distracting to me. I don't want any of that fuzziness in my model. Just, just don't call any of your layers grass and then you can remove that fuzziness. Are there any other um, textures that have properties similar to that where it adjusts it based on the name? I believe water is one as well. So if you create a, a layer called water, um, they'll create a water look, watery looking texture. Do you recommend closing out of Enscape anytime we're manipulating the model in Rhino, like adding assets or changing things? Would, do you typically close out and reopen every time? If you have multiple monitors, I like I keep Enscape open, but sometimes your laptops or your computers aren't powerful enough, and just you just gotta play around with it a bit. If it turns out like you're modeling, modeling and just it, it keeps crashing, keeps crashing, then you probably need to close out. Any questions? Um, okay, let me see, we're at 11 a.m. So what I'll do is this, is uh, instead of over teaching you guys, it's, I feel like you just need some time to play around with it and mess around with it. And we can, we can uh, gather together next week in studio and then hopefully by then you'll, you've started your section and um, you will have more questions because really modeling is all it is just is just testing and um, playing around with it. I want to give you guys a few other tools and techniques that I've used as part of my workflow. Um, it, you may not need them for your workflow. Maybe all you do is you do what I'm showing right here, which is just taking the section and extruding out and applying materials to the, the section itself. Um, but one thing I will, I, I have added into this workshop three model is the River Region Trails logo, like you see right here. So I've added that logo in this model here. Let's just take that logo and move it. Move it to the... So again, this is this is like a very simple way of of uh, adding the branding to the to the project. Is just add the logo as like a paving element. But I want everyone to think about how you begin to integrate, you know, the the River Region Trails branding as somewhere as some element of your design, whether it's signage, whether it's art, whether it's taking this this logo and like making a big mural on the greenery itself. Um, but we really, I think it's really, really important and really valuable to Will O'Connor and Andrew to, to have their identity as part of the, the trail itself. So, you know, I just threw in the logo as a, like a paving element and um, you know, we're just throwing a fire up Enscape and see how that looks.
it doesn't look that great, honestly, like looking here, but that's where it's just, it's just playing around with it uh, and seeing what you can come up with. This is like something like that is, is probably the simplest way to, to add that, but think about signage, think about wayfinding, think about art, like I said, um, but we want this to be their greenway, not uh, any generic greenway. So what I want to do now is um, I want to show you a quick workflow on how to take um, the, the Greenway section and export it out so that you actually have a, a rendering and line work that you can uh, compose within Photoshop later. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, go to the name view. So I'm going to go to the view management tab go to this uh, Enscape view right here um, so that we have this as their, our view here. I'm going to actually make the output here 5100 by 3300. And this is just an 11 by 17 aspect ratio. But the reason I do this, I just want to have the whole section within the view. Um, I think other thing I'm going to do is the trees right now are kind of like in the way of the greenway. I just want this the, this to make sense. So what I'm going to do is this. First, I'm going to move these objects out of the way because they're kind of in the view. And then I'm going to take this this these trees here. I'm just going to move them to this side. So now it's like that. And you change the lighting or whatever to make it look somewhat like the way you want it to look. And again, make sure you have the view set. And then what you want to do, um, save the model. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take this section here and we're going to snapshot, create a snapshot. So click on this thing called screenshot. And then it's going to save it somewhere. I'm just going to save it on my desktop and I'm just going to call it, um, view hit save and i hope this does not crash i hope this does not crash because i was testing this the earlier and it crashed a few times and i think it's because of my the fact that i'm working on a surface book and the surface book isn't a great rendering program but uh it looks like it's working And you know, if your if your Enscape is crashing or anything like that, you know, I recommend um, using the virtual machines to get around that issue. So it's exporting. I hope. Do you recommend leaving below grade like a void that you have right now, or do you ever model like any kind of fill when you're making these sections? I personally like to leave a void because I like the the um, emphasis to be on the above grade elements. But you can decide if if uh, the below grade elements are important. So we worked on a project, actually the rendering that is in the assignment sheet, we did model the below grade condition because what we are proposing as part of the best practices of the greenway construction is to have structural soil underneath the greenway at all times so that the any trees that we plant along the greenway would always have a, a, a greater amount of soil volume so that they can grow healthy. Um, and so what we did was we modeled the actual below grade condition. So. It's up to your design. Let's just put it that way. If if you think talking about the the actual soil condition below your surface matters, then the model it. It's working. I can see the percentage going up, which is a good sign. Phew, because if it didn't work, I would have been I would have been sad. Hopefully you guys are learning something. Hopefully I've taught you something.
All right, and exported. Um, so now what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna close out of landscape. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to export some line work out of here. So here's what I do. What I do is I, in Rhino, I click on this little, right, right underneath all the viewports that you see here, I click on this little plus icon here and I create a new layout. And we'll call this one uh, view export or whatever. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an 11 by 17 page size because that's when I when I set the resolution of the the uh, rendering export 5100 by 3300. That's an 11 by 17 at 300 DPI. So I create an 11 by 17 page. So that's right there, view export. Have a little uh, viewport here. Keep in mind that all elements, even within the viewport, are also on layers as well. So if I click on this layer here and go to properties, um, you see it's it's in the layer Enscape trees, which doesn't make any sense. I'm just going to put this on the default layer because that's what you know most elements should be. It should be in the default layer. And then I hit PP on my keyboard, and it brings up the the actual uh, control of the viewport. So. That allows me to scale the viewport to maximize and snap to the edges of the actual page itself. And then, uh, you know, similar to CAD, like if you double click within the viewport, then you can actually um, move around the viewport itself. But then you double click out of it and then you're back in the page space. So double click in the viewport here and then go to your name view. So click on the arrow here, go to set view, then Enscape name view one. And so now you've, captured the line work version of this same view that matches the, the line work of the export that we just had. Um, I'm gonna turn off, oops, turn off Enscape trees because we want to have a very simple line work base to overlay on top of that. One thing you can do before you even export is that you can actually add like dimension lines and annotations within this uh, viewport itself. So here's how you do that. Um, go to the front view, which is the section view, right? Create a new layer, we'll call this one annotation. Set that, to be, set that to be the current layer, give it a color, like give it a color of green or something, it doesn't matter what color it is. And then go to dimension and choose a line or a linear dimension, let's choose linear dimension. Then you can dimension out Say for instance, the greenway itself, you could dimension out, say for instance, uh, this planted area next to that. You could dimension out this planted area next to that. Obviously you might have some other elements that have more specific dimensions, but I just wanted to add a few simple layouts just to show what it looks like. Because when 3D, it actually like models everything in 3D and has everything um, in the in the model space in 3D stuff. So you can actually create 3D annotations that like follow the, the section line itself. Now you notice how like the numbers here just look, look really weird, they look big. Um, the way to fix that is to go to the options, go to annotation styles and see right here it says enable layout space scaling. If you uncheck that, then the, the numbers are the same scale as the numbers in the model itself. That's how you fix that. So all this stuff here, all this stuff here, we're going to export out. Um, another thing you can do is, uh, you, right now you can see right, right everything is kind of like an, in a wireframe view. It's not very nice. Um, and you know, Trey, you were asking, how do we, how do we get the line work and we make it editable? So in in Rhino, there's a tool called Make 2D. Um, it's a very, very overly used tool that students in every single architecture program uses all the time to, to get like line work um, out of their model and making it look like almost like a comic book. If you select the objects that you want to turn into a, like a 2D line work overlay, then type in Make 2D brings up like this 2D, make 2D thing. And there's a bunch of objects that you can, you can choose um, 
I uncheck hidden lines and I also check scene silhouette. And I'll show you why in a second. And click OK. And then in top view, would, would you see we've created is essentially like this 2D, um, 2D wireframe of the, the thing itself. Scene silhouette, this kind of creates a profile curve around the whole thing, which is kind of a nice uh, border around everything. And then just the curves themselves are just the curves themselves. So what I do sometimes is I take these curves, right? I hit Control G on my keyboard. And then Control G, that, that, just, that just groups everything together. So it's all like one object. I take this, I hit Control K to cut it. I go to the viewport, I paste it by saying, hitting Control V. It's now like basically you've, you've pasted in like 2D line work over the, the model viewport itself. Then you scale it to match the scale of this. So I hit M on my keyboard and move, let's say this corner point to that corner point right there and type in scale then scale it from that reference point to let's say that reference point. So now essentially what we've done is I've, uh, I've kind of like mixed a bunch of things together. I've, uh, I've, I've mixed the 2D line work on top of the actual section line work itself. Um, yeah, the section line work, which is these objects here. So I can actually turn off all the three elements in the, in the model. And all I have left over is essentially the section and the 2D line work, but everything is in perspective. And this just is a, just a nice clean way of creating a, a line work base that you can export out. So what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna take this line work base, say your model, and thank, thankfully everything is, maybe is recorded on my Zoom call. So even if you forgot what I did, just play back the video later and you can remember how I did this. But you see what I've done, like very little effort and you've created a very simple 2D line work base. So here's how you, here's how you get it out of, a, out of a Rhino into Illustrator. So you right click on view export, hit print. And in a second, a print dialogue will pop up. And you want to export this out as a PDF. So there's Adobe PDF, there's also Rhino PDF. Um, so if you don't have Adobe PDF available, you can always just use Rhino PDF. And then in size here, you wanna set that to be an 11 by 17 tabloid landscape. So now it's matched, it's matched it. You wanna make sure it's set to vector output. And that's it. So then basically once that's set, you just hit print. And then it's gonna save a PDF somewhere, just save on your desktop, we'll call this one. Um, view lines, hit save. And now you can open Illustrator. And now Trey, you can do everything you want that you just asked me to do, which is take the line work, you can edit it in Illustrator. Illustrator, in my opinion, is, is best used as an editing tool. You have line work that, that's being drawn in another program like Rhino. You import that into Illustrator and then you edit the line work in there, change the line weights. Um, so I'll show, you, I'll show you how you can very quickly compose a section using uh, the things that we just exported out. So open up that PDF we just exported. I save it on my desktop. View lines. And then you can just like basically begin to, um, what I do always, whenever this, uh, this thing comes, um, export, it's always like organized uh, within these clipping groups. So I always try to clean up that as much as, as the first step. So I do is I go to select, object clipping masks. So you can see in the layers panel on the side, all the clipping masks have been selected. So I just hit delete on my keyboard and all the clip masks are magically gone. And then what you do is you click on the, 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 the master layer and then you hit control shift G on your keyboard and that ungroups everything. I wanna, I wanna reduce the hierarchy first 
explode the hierarchy first. Then you can click on any um, line, hit select object or same appearance, and then it basically selects all the lines of a similar type. So you can quickly begin to um, isolate objects in different layers. And what I do is I create a shortcut in Illustrator, Control D, same, see, appearance is Control D. Um, uh, there's a way in Illustrator, I believe it's uh, in the uh, preferences um, user interface, I believe. Uh, can't remember where the, Maybe it's not in here, it's in preferences. Oh, keyboard shortcuts right here, yeah. So you can, you can, you can set custom keyboard shortcuts in here. And I believe select same is in menu, select same appearance. So I set um, appearance to be control D. You see control D is like my favorite shortcut. So now, you know, select the line here, control D, it selects all the lines of that same type, create a new layer, move it to a new layer. So you quickly begin to organize all of your assets. Illustrator, so you can like adjust the line weights of everything differently. So just do that a few times. What I also do, I'm not doing this right now, but I, you know, obviously label um, everything as I sort the lines. So eventually you should be able to categorize everything to different lines. And now everything's in its own layer. So now I can just, you know, select everything. Let's say for instance, um, let's see. I want, these are annotation layers. So I'm gonna set that to be annotation. Uh, these are dimension lines. I said that dimensions. This is that profile line. So I just said that at the top. Let's turn it off first. Then everything else, we'll just select everything at, at once. Set it to like 0.5. Black. And then the profile line, we'll just select that. Make that black as well. Make that like two or three points. Let's make it three points. There's a weird section right here where the profile line isn't complete, but you can fix that yourself later. Take the dimension lines, make that like 0.5, black, give it a dashed, give it a dashed pattern to it. Get the numbers, make that black as well. Now you've created a simple line work base. You, are, you should refine it, obviously, like right now, um, the section line itself probably should be thicker. So the section line itself is, looks to be this one right here. So I'll call this one section line. Uh, let's select that and just make it like two points. Let's uh, take this profile line, make it less thick, so one point. So that doesn't look that bad. So section. Then just save that, save as, save as an Illustrator file, save it. Okay, open Photoshop. And one thing I didn't do when I exported out the, the rendering is I, you can also export out helper layers like alpha channels and material channels and depth channels and that kind of thing. And basically in Enscape, if I open up Enscape real quick again, in the export settings, you can check the, uh, the setting to uh, export out ID channels. Um,
So in the export settings, uh, sorry, Photoshop's opening. Go click on this uh, visual settings button right here. And then the output right here, you can, you can uh, check this right here, export object ID, material ID, depth channel. And export, that exports a bunch of helper layers. And what that basically looks like, it looks like this. I did a few tests earlier. Um, like this is the layer that you, do, you export out. And then the ID channel looks something like that. And then the depth channel looks something like that. And then the other ID channels like that. So these are just layers that you can use in Photoshop to help, um, say for instance, change the color of various objects um, in the layer or use the depth channel to add some like depth to the image. So in Photoshop, what I'll do is I'll open the exported section that we just created. I called it view, I believe. And then you go into file, place embedded. Then you place the um, Illustrator line work and crop to the media box. Then just scale it to fit the page. And it might not fit exactly. So at that point, you just kind of like work with it until it fits the section, which should not take that much effort to do. You can see you can, can eventually just get it right. And hit enter. And then at this point, it's pretty much just you going in and um, making it look good. So, you know, for instance, like this leader down here is kind of cropped off. So I'll just, you know, choose the crop option and just extend it out a little bit more so that I get that maybe the you don't, need, you don't need too much of that area above there. Um, you know, this all this gray stuff in the background. If you had an ID channel, you can easily clean that up. But, you know, the Magic Wand tool does a pretty decent job as well. So you can use the Magic Wand tool to um, uh, isolate uh, the section. You can add a white background to... area behind the section, and then you can add some uh, adjustment layers like curves to brighten it up a bit, add some contrast. Uh, I like to use these things called color lookup filters. Um, what that does is basically add like a little Instagram style filter over the the rendering so you just play around with these and see if you have a if there's like a, a style that looks good to you but you know play around with that and see if you might find some style like maybe you want dark bleak looking rendering or you want a cinematic looking rendering you can uh, play around with that and find a style that looks good to you that's just me that's just me telling you what i like to do but you don't have to do that you don't even have, even have to add um the rendering but there's this one called futuristic bleak right here so you want that futuristic bleak um rendering style you can do that just have a, just have fun with it my whole point is this this wasn't that hard to make now, now that you've seen me make this right here like even though this is a crappy section you can draw a good section and using a few of the tools that, that you can do you can actually create a pretty decent section perspective out of rhino that has dimensions and then on top of that let's say you know once you have this just save as Save it as a Photoshop file, call it a few. I know I'm getting pretty much pretty in depth here, but I just wanna, the whole point is that this should be easy. This should be a fun assignment. What I like to do is like, once I have the section um, rendered out, um, this, this futuristic bleak, I don't like very much. Let's make it like a fun one. Open InDesign. Have you guys learned anything today? I can't tell. Like, has, uh, has this been helpful? 
Okay, good. This is great. You didn't realize how easy this is. It's so easy. You just needed, you need guidance from the right person. But now that you realize how easy it is, it's like, wow, like I don't need to make one section. I actually make, actually make two sections. I can make three sections, but start with one, do one section and get good at that. And then we'll, we'll build from there. Like, um, we're going to have, think about this from a studio standpoint. We have, uh, you know, a whole group of students, we're going to have a whole group of sections. And so it's not just your section, it's your section in the family of sections that we have as a studio. Um, so I'm going to create a new layout in InDesign. I'm going to create a, uh, a tabloid uh, page in landscape. And I'm going to, this, I like to add labels in InDesign and um, you know how to do this already, but I'm, I'm just literally just like following through. I'm going, like I made the shot, like you've seen NBA basketball, you make the shot, you have to follow through, and you go to the very end of the, of the workflow, even though you know it's gonna go in the basket. Um, then I, I simply, you know, add. Hey Frank. Yeah. Um, this, is a, this is a modeling question, not an InDesign question, but what if you're trying to tie um, like a section design into existing slope, like your site's not flat. You say, so you want your, when you say your site's not flat, you mean, um, Sorry, ask, uh, ask the question one more time. Maybe I, I didn't quite get it. Like, um... I mean, like, so if I'm trying to, if I'm trying to design a uh, greenway path that cuts into the Jackson cut, so I'm changing the terrain of the existing, I'm changing the existing terrain to something different. Um, how would I do that? Um, okay, good question. So what you need to do is you need a reference section, right? You need to know what the existing section of Jackson Cut actually looks like. You need to modify it essentially. So this is a technique that I thought about explaining, but it might've gotten too much detail, but you asked Anna, so therefore I must answer the question. How do you cut a section through existing conditions. Um, before I finish that, let me just, I just want to like, just say, you know, like this is the last, last step is basically just adding in descriptions, place, insert place or text and adding that in there, choosing your font. I like, I'm really, as you can probably figure it out by now, I'm a big fan of the Roboto font. I think it looks nice. It reminds me of the New York Times. Um, their articles, so I like to use that font, it's nice and small. You can like throw things around. This is, I mean, I don't know, I mean, this is where it gets like fun. You can like, like begin to like, really like add some, description to your work. Like that's essentially what we're going for is we're going for something like that as a deliverable, like a very detailed section cut with descriptions of what you're doing with dimensions, greenery section through grassy swale, whatever. Um, that's the deliverable. This took me an hour to make, but you don't, you're gonna spend more than an hour on this. So yours is gonna look infinitely better than this, this, this really bad section that I made. Um, that's what we're going for. Um, to answer Anna's question. My cat's going crazy in the background. Um, what you need to use is a little bit of, it's a tool in GIS called interpolate shape. So I'm gonna open ArcGIS right now. I, have it, I, had, I had it like pulled up in the background just in case Anna asked a question like that. I was hoping no one would ask that question, but she ruined it again. 
Um, I don't know why you keep ruining ruining my tutorials by asking good questions, but um, I, I guess I have no choice. So Jackson cut. Um, you want to draw a section through the Jackson cut. So basically, what you need to do is you need to draw a line. So in, in GIS, uh, go into um, into your folders. You need to create a, create a, a geometry in your geo database or just a shape file. It doesn't matter. I'll create a, a line in my geo database. So I'll right click on the geo database, hit new, future class. Call this one section cut. And we're going to call make that a line. Then just click next, next. Make sure it's set to the Alabama East uh, coordinate system. Next, 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 finish. Then add that section cut layer to your model or to your GIS file. So that section cut right there. So then what we're gonna do is we're gonna click in that section cut line, go to edit, create, click on section cut, and then click on the line tool, and then just draw a section. So section through Jackson cut, double click the close. Section through Jackson cut cemetery, double click the close. Section through Jackson cut cemetery, double click the close. You have three sections there. Let's draw one more just because. Okay. Then save the section. Can you hear my cat mirroring the background? Yeah, no. Should I let the cat in? Should I let the cat in? All right, one second. The door is open, so the cat will come in momentarily. So here's what you do. We have your sections drawn. Um, go to geoprocessing, type in uh, interpolate. There's this tool called interpolate shape. It's part of the 3D analyst geoprocessing tool set. So click on that. Give it a second to think. We're gonna, we're gonna end, I'm gonna go no further than 12.30 because I promised we'd end at 12.30. So we got maybe about 50 minutes left, but I hope we don't take that long. So input surface, basically uh, choose one of the, the DEMs. If you choose the 001, that's gonna be the highest quality section. So let's just do that to see what it looks like. Input features, choose section cut. Output feature class, um, it's just call this one, call this one section uh, cut line, whatever. Um, and then in Z factor, leave that as one. Remember, uh, the DEM that we got from Montgomery is already in feet. So we don't need to add it. We don't need to add Z factor to that. So then hit run. Just make, make the whole like uh, geoprocessing window look like this. Hit run. And you see what happens is it create a new layer called section cut line. So then what you do is you go, you go here, go to um, export, export to CAD, and input features, uh, export out the section line and also export the section cut as well. Save as a DWG and output file, just save it as, um, save it on your desktop. Give it a second. Not sure why the desktop's not showing up. I'm just gonna save it in my uh, my Montgomery tutorial folder. Let's call this one test. Actually, I'll just leave it in here. Yeah, it already saves it in there. Okay, whatever. You you you'll be able to save it to some folder, and then go to environments, Ottawa coordinate system, current map, then hit run.
then find the location where it exported. In my case, it should be in here. Right here, export CAD. And if you open uh, Rhino and import, my cat's going crazy. But don't, if your cat goes crazy, don't believe your cat because the cat is lying to you. They don't need to eat every single minute of the day. Um, so import the CAD section. Uh, make sure it sets feet in the import units. So click OK. Then hit Control D on your keyboard. And what you see now is you've exported out. Um, I'm not sure I only exported one out. Did I have what selected? I see selection cut. I'm not sure why I only exported one. It should have exported all of them. Let me see, did I actually have accidentally have them selected? Oh, Might not, I might not have saved it when I, when I drew the other lines for some reason. Um, when I'm looking at this right now, it only exported one section. Um, oh, no, I had it selected when I did the interpolate shape. That's why I did that. Whatever, believe me. If you didn't have uh, one selected when you did the interpolate shape, it would have uh, exported all the, all the lines out. In any case, you have a section now. That's the whole, the whole story at the end of this process is now basically you can move that to the origin point you can rotate it. And that is now the starting point to Jackson cut right there. So I just compared the Jackson cut to the fake section that I drew. So I hope that, that answers your question. I don't think I did. Oh, well. That's how you can get a, that's how you can get a, like a, a quick section, an existing condition section um, out of. Um, I mean, it sort of answers my question. I guess what I'm asking you is like, I mean, that's helpful for sure. But like, if I'm a, the, obviously the, the Jackson cut and maybe this would have made more sense if you had gotten your other cuts out. Maybe I don't know, but um, you know, it's it's not a straight line. And this is, and I'm just using the Jackson cut as an example. Like we have a model of it. However, the however the design is going to be modeled within the Jackson cut isn't going to be a straight line. Yeah. You know, if there's like a perspective behind it, I just, I guess I'm, I'm in my mind, I'm trying to understand like how, how I'm supposed to grade and like have that grade be realistic to what's happening. Yeah. So I, I still recommend that you use these typical sections, like even though it's one little area of Jackson cut and maybe the width of the cut changes and 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 uh, moves around to grade. Okay, so I'm going to show you guys. I have two tricks that I'm going to show you guys. Two grasshopper scripts, and I didn't want to get into grasshopper because I know it's it's a bit of a bit of a crazy thing. But I have a few helper tools that you can use to make your section drawing process a little bit more precise. So in the box folder that I've uh, uploaded in there, there is two grasshopper scripts. One is called um, slope viewer and one is called ramp. These are two tools that I use a lot. Um, there's, also, there's also this thing called face camera, which I'll get into in a second, which is a fun thing you can do as well. But slope viewer and ramp are two grasshopper scripts. So open grasshopper, the way you open grasshopper is you click in the standard tab. There's this little button that looks like a grasshopper. Click on that. And then open up the tool called Slope Viewer. And there's a little grasshopper script in here that I wrote that I use on almost all my projects. 
And this utilizes a geometry pipeline in order to, to work. So you don't need to know how this works. You don't need to understand what's going on here. All you need to understand is that if you have a layer in Rhino called slope, it's automatically gonna bring those lines into this Grasshopper script and visualize the slope of that line. So here's how that works. We're gonna create a new layer called slope. Oh, there's already a slope layer, it's right here. So make the slope layer your current layer then any line you draw, let's go into the front view, will automatically tell you the slope percentage of that line. So maybe, Anna, one thing you could do is you could use this as a technique to say, for instance, you know, if you put the path here and then you just slope back up to the existing grade, you can begin to you know, grade it in such a way where you can actually have slopes that are realistic. Um, in, in this case, you want to try to generally stay within 40% um, in order to actually be um, uh, not too steep. I use this tool quite a lot because um, yeah. um, because it allows me to easily, easily draw sections and have slopes. Sorry, that's my cat again, um, visualized. Um, and so this tool here, we're, we're sh I'm showing you basically how to, to do the, the slopes, but then you can basically take these lines here and turn that into, let's say you trim, you know, this portion of Jackson cut, you basically created your, your cut and fill section using this tool here. Um, so I highly recommend you try using this the slope tool here to make your section drawing process a little bit more precise and also hopefully a little bit more fun um, because then you don't have to do any math. You don't have to say, okay, well, if I draw a line here, and draw a slope up that way, you know, it's, does it actually like work? Like that doesn't work. 70%, that, that is too steep. So you're gonna need to mess with that until you get to a slope that say was in between 30 to 40%. Does that make sense? Did I help? Frank, are we looking at the the percentages that you currently have up um, for slope? Are you able to see those because of the grasshopper command that you did earlier, or is that just a layer that you have? I guess that is a grasshopper command, right? It's a, it's a grasshopper script. If okay. I turn off the grasshopper script, these are just lines. These are just lines in Rhino that don't mean anything. And essentially, what the grasshopper script is doing is this is it's taking this, this line here and it's simply asking a few questions. Number one, like between the start and end point of that line, how much horizontal change and how much vertical change is happening. If we turn on some of these other layers in here to illustrate that point, that's essentially what the grasshopper script is doing is it's taking every slope that you draw and figuring out the slope triangle. Then just simply creating a, a equation in here that takes the, the length and the vertical change and horizontal change, dividing it um, against another and then doing a little thing here to visualize the percentage. Uh, this is a very handy tool just because, um, you know, pretty much everything that we do in landscape architecture is dealing with slopes. And instead of having to like draw lines and then measure them out and then like do the math on the side, you just need to be able to like draw a line and say like, that is a slope, that is a slope, that is slope and easily figure out like these are these are surfaces, these are transitions, surfaces, transitions, and just be able to like very quickly say like, okay, well, 4% is a bit too, too steep. So let's just adjust it until it gets to like an actual percentage that is constructible. So the slope viewer, that is a tool within the, the um, uh, series of tools in the folder here, it's called slope viewer right here. The second tool, and this is a tool that's a little bit more advanced, but if you want to get fancy, and I don't know why you want to get fancy, but let's say you want to get fancy on me, um, I have a tool called Ramp right here. Ramp is might be my masterpiece. It might be it might be a, a, a grasshopper script that I've I've created that makes makes grading and landscape design so much easier. Um, 
and I'll show you why. So again, it utilizes a pipeline command called ramp study. So if you have a layer in Grasshopper called ramp study, let's create one right now, it will automatically bring in the lines in that layer. So I'm gonna turn this off temporarily. I'm actually gonna actually, I'm actually gonna disable it first. Then I'm gonna draw a couple of lines in the ramp study layer. So let's draw. And then I'm gonna draw, use the fillet command. I'm gonna do it like a, a 10 foot fillet to create like little radiuses. And we're gonna create a little ramp that goes up a slope. Right, so this is flat right now, but imagine that this ends up becoming a, a slope ramp. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take this line here and explode it so that it has the runs and then the turns as separate objects. Then we're gonna turn on the points for just the runs themselves. So I type in PP so that I can get the actual um, um, uh, endpoints of the runs, and then we're going to create a little ramp like so. But the turns are flat. That, that's why I, I didn't turn the points on for the turns, because when you reach a turn, you want it, when you want, we want it to be flat. So that's our, that's our ramp. And then you can go back into Grasshopper, enable the tool. And essentially what we've created is a little ramp. Now the tool only works if there are two ramps in the model. So you have to like draw like another dummy ramp on the side um, that doesn't do anything. So I'll just create a ramp on the side that doesn't do anything. Um, we, we ignore that one. Um, but if you have two ramps on the side, now essentially what you've done is you created a ramp that visualizes the ramp and the percentage of the ramp. So now you can go back in here and say, all right, 15% is too high for this first run here. So we just adjust that down until we get a 5% ramp, so 6%. And so now we're at 4.9%. We've reached, we've reached accessible, accessible slopes. Then you go to the next run here, and then you go and you adjust that a little bit until you get to 5% ramp. So there we go, we're at 4.4%. And then the last run, we do that until we get to, um, or can even just make it longer. That also should help. So that's good. So now you've created a, an accessible ramp using a simple centerline curve. The Grasshopper script, what it does essentially is it takes that curve, offsets it on the other end to create the walk itself and then like flattens the walk so that it's like an actual flat walk. Uh, these lines here are the actual contours cutting through the walk itself. One thing that this script does not do is doesn't doesn't add the cross slope to the ramp itself. But for a conceptual model, that's fine. Like you don't need to worry about the cross slopes for a concept design. You just need to have the general run of the walk um, in the in the in the design itself. And then what you can do is basically in the script itself here the ramp width right now is set to six. You know, if you want that to be five. Oops, sorry, got to do that. What that does now, it's like, it's a five foot offset on either um, side of this walk. So this is a, a 10, foot, 10 foot walk. Now that I've set that to five because it's the ramp width divided by two. And then we can do, um, there's a bunch of other things in here, but once you're done with that, you have a simple surface that results in this number three section right here. This, you can now create a new layer and you can bake that. And now you've created a sloped walk that represents um, a grading condition. And then what you do from that point here is you just simply create the rest of the transitions in between the the walks themselves so what you do is you create a let's say for instance uh, click on the layer duplicate the border for that so that we get some curves and create a new layer change that curve to be that layer change layer so now i have a curve of the 
curve of the outline of that walk itself. And then you can um, draw a couple of lines like this to represent a surface in between this area here. Take that curve here, type in split or TT, split it using these curves here. They can take these four curves that result in and type in network surface to create the transitional surface in between. Take this surface curve here, type in that curve there, type in patch to clean that up. You can begin to create like little sloped walks in between your uh, walks themselves. Do the same thing up here. Do something like that. Split this with that. Type in network surface. One, two, three, four. Create a surface in between the two. Type in patch. Clean up this little corner there. Anything that's yellow, I just flip to be correct. Orientation. Then you have like the start of a walk. Then you can take all these surfaces here. Type in contour. Contour from the zero, zero, zero point. One foot contours in between. Group that. And you can very quickly begin to develop like a rough scheme of how to like create an accessible path, say for instance, down into your space. Then you can obviously take the surfaces here, change that to be grass. Take these surface here, change that to be concrete. The texture looks weird like it does right now. Just simply add a texture map to that. So go to mapping, uh, planar mapping, bounding box, C plane, UV. Repeat it by like five and five. Take some trees, copy it over. So that little that little uh, walk that MVVA designed out in um, Chicago, we've just modeled our version of that. Then fire up Enscape. Run over there. You can actually walk around here. Modeling is easy. If you use my tricks. Any questions? This is kind of a practical question, but right now the slopes on your ramp vary by like half of a percentage. Is that something that you would avoid doing in a design or is that something that wouldn't really be noticeable? Like uh, 4.9, 4.4, 3.8. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Um, the most important thing is that the slopes are consistent along the entire run of the walk itself. But if one slope is 4.9 and one slope is 4.4 and another slope is 3.8, um, that's actually not that noticeable in real life. Uh, it just needs to work with the design. Um, but again, yeah, what's most important is that like the run itself, like this doesn't go 4.4 to like 3.8 where it's like changing mid walk. But like in real life, like these are, you can't really tell the difference between um, the slopes for these here. But if you want, it, but generally speaking, under 5% is what you want to do for all of your walks uh, because you don't want to create ramps with handrails and landings unless it's 100% absolutely necessary, like you have no choice. But usually we can design it in such a way where we stay under 5%. So that's what we're doing here. So the ramp tool, this ramp 01 that I've given you, that is in box right here, ramp 01. So you can play, mess with that tool. If you forgot how to use it, just open up, um, open up my video tutorial and you can see how that works. Any questions about anything I've shown? Is there anything I haven't shown that anyone's curious about how to do? Now so put this in a model. <laughs> 
I want <laughs> like you want to put this into your Infrarix model, right? Yep. We'll do that in the next in the next tutorial. What I want the reason why we're not doing that in this phase right here is because everyone here needs to learn how to model stuff in 3D first. You need you need to like start here and then once you've mastered this step, then you can go into the site condition. So the typical section is a is a is an assignment that allows you to model without the burden of having to tie it in exactly to real conditions. So that's why I said typical section. It's like find a section that is like I said, typical in your project. Then once you learn how to model, then we can go into the actual site. So the next assignment after assignment five is going to be modeling and designing the nodes, whether it's the park or whether it's an intersection or, or something that's within your site. So we start with the typical section and then we move, we move into the node, which is a bit more of a site specific design. But are we not gonna have to know how to do, like, are we not gonna have to know how to do this to, to produce perspective renderings? You mean for the like, next assignment, like for assignment five? Like, well, like for instance, like, you know, the perspective rendering is literally just standing down here, right? And getting a snapshot of what it looks like on the path. Yeah, uh, but that if that's designed into your, if you've, I, don't, I just don't understand how you're supposed to like only design of a typical section in 2D and then I don't understand how you, how we can't how we I, I don't under, understand how you're supposed to do both like without knowing how to fit this stuff in your existing site I guess is what I'm saying like I know you can create your 2D section and I know you can place that up against your your existing but then nothing behind it is going to be the same unless you know how to put a model into your existing site. I don't, I'm having a hard time understanding like how, I, if you, how it, that's supposed to be. I think you're overthinking it. That's, that's my, that's, that's, that's unfortunately the, the comment that maybe you, you didn't want to hear. All we need to do is we just need to, we need to start with a baseline condition of like, this is what it looks like. The background of the of the section itself could just be a photograph, let's say of an area or like a street view of the photo. Like it just needs to be somewhat within the within the site. But the end result, like for the section itself, is just a basic section. Like it's just typical section. The rendering itself, um, you can try to find a location that sort of matches the perspective, but it doesn't have to be perfect. We'll create more renderings further down. We'll get to that level of site specificity. Um, in later assignments. But again, what I'm trying to do with this assignment is just make sure that everyone is comfortable actually 3D modeling, because that's what my first sense was that students just didn't know how to 3D model. And so in order to learn that process, we just got to start with a very simple assignment, which is this. Does that make sense? All right. Um, I'm trying to think, is there anything else? The last thing um, that I was going to show you guys, it's 12.06, so this will be the last thing I showed. This is literally like super dumb. And quite frankly, you probably don't even need to listen to this, but I will um, tell you this is that, you know, you can add, you know, scale figures into your model. So um, like these little people here. Um, before we had scale models like we did here, we had another uh, version, which is adding people directly into the model. Um, and so what I've done is I've provided everyone in the texture folder in here, let's see, workshop three, the textures, this thing called alpha, alpha peeps. And so these are all my peeps in here. You can see all these are all the people that you can drop into your model. And this is a this is a nice way to add in scale figures in a model that look like actual people and aren't necessarily like 3D rendered people. So the way you do that is simply just use create a new layer in here, call it peeps, set to be current layer, then utilize the picture frame, picture plane tool. So the picture plane tool is a tool that um, 
I think I showed it in the previous tutorial, but you can actually use that to add scale figures in your model. So I click on that. And then find the texture of a person that you want to add. So find one that looks good. Let's say, uh, this guy. And then what you do is you choose the vertical option in the picture plane tool right here. And then what you can do is basically you can just basically draw a person in your model like so. And then what you want to do is you want to scale that. So I use my control D tool here, type in scale, and then scale that to be, let's say six. So it's six foot high person, which is, you know, kind of, kind of tall for a guy. Maybe if you want to do 5.8, a little bit shorter. So this is, this is a nice way to add a person into the model. That's not like these 3D models. Um, the reason why this might be handy <clears throat> is uh, sometimes the models themselves don't look that great up close. And so you actually just want to use a real photograph for say your foreground person. And I'll show you what I mean in a second. So let's move this person like over here. Um, let's go open Enscape. Again, this is for the, not necessarily for the section itself, but this is for, say, for instance, the perspective, the second deliverable. So I'm up Enscape. And while that's, um, I think, opening up. Oh, it's right here, yeah. Um, so you can see right there. Um, again, the whole point is that sometimes if you have like these people as your foreground elements, they just look, they look okay, but they don't look that great. And sometimes having an actual person as a foreground element helps a little bit. So what I recommend doing is downloading this thing called face camera right here. And this is a little like Rhino, um, a little Rhino um, um, tool. And I'll show you what it does. Basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit this button here, match cameras. So that any camera view that I set in uh, Rhino matches with uh, the angle in um, Enscape. And sometimes like you put, you put the scale figure around here and it doesn't quite line up. If you type in face camera, that automatically aligns the scale figure with the actual um, position of the camera itself. So type in face camera and you can begin to say, for instance, add a very convincing foreground element. Let's say let's move the cyclist back a bit. I'm trying to create a composition on the, on the left side here, face camera. You might need to adjust it a little bit. Like that's a way that uh, you can add some scale figures in your rendering that don't look like CGI scale figures and actually look at real people. So I'm giving you a bunch of options on how you can um, add some images and people into your renderings to hopefully again, make it more cinematic. And again, like I said, um, I recommend going into the visualization settings here and output I'm changing that to be like 6,700 by, I can't remember what I did, 3,500, something like that. So you, you can create like a nice cinematic looking view. So. Does that make sense to everybody? All right. I don't know. I don't know if I've done it. I don't know. I, I feel like there's a lot. There's a lot of naysayers, particularly Anna, who have, have, have like made me doubt my the effectiveness of this tutorial. But hopefully, you guys all have learned something today and can take these techniques and create some cool-looking perspectives 
create some cool looking uh, renderings. Yeah, I will post this video on YouTube later um, after it processes. All right, that's the end of the workshop. Yeah.